Good afternoon, good afternoon everybody and welcome to the magnificent northeast corner of South Africa, recently voted the most wonderful and beautiful country in the world on planet Earth. We are sitting in the great Kruger National Park, 2.2 million hectares, 3.5 million acres of wilderness wonderland which expands north into Zimbabwe and east into Mozambique to form the Greater Limpopo Transfrontier Park, which is 8 million acres of wilderness wonderland. You are on a very live safari which means that this is unedited, and that means we'd love for you to talk to us, ask us about what we're seeing, give us comments about what you think we should be seeing, and just generally have a conversation about the wildlife here and all the country and the continent at large. My name is James Hendry. On camera today, we've got David. Hello, David. Hi there, James. You've got something under your hat there. It's a buff, is it? It's a buff. Yes, that's a very modern thing. I don't know what a buff is. I've never worn one in my life. And then sitting, riding a shotgun, if, as it were, is Sam, who will be taking you on a drive tomorrow morning. Hello, Sam. Hi there. Yes, there we go. Uh, and if you do wish to talk to us, and indeed we encourage it, hashtag Safari Live if you're on the tweet tweet, like those ox peckers that you can hear calling there. That's them. Uh, or questions at wildearth.tv if you'd like to talk to us on the email. Uh, you can also, if you're watching on YouTube, use the YouTube chat function, which, as I've said before, is totally beyond my understanding. Uh, now, for those of you who are keeping bird lists, we've just spotted a very special bird that is nomadic. In other words, not migratory, but nomadic. It comes in and out of an area, and I don't see it anymore, unfortunately. But I will show you a picture of what it was and we will keep an eye out for it because they'll normally come into an area for a little while and then they'll go away. And that bird is the lark-like bunting. The lark-like bunting. And Susie, 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 you're on Twitter and you say you would like to see a cheetah. In fact, you repeated that you would like to see a cheetah four or five times. Just some buffalo looking a bit upset at the moment behind us. I think they're just having an old man squabble, to be honest. Those are some hardy dars flying off. Now, my plan this afternoon, and therefore your plan, although, as Susie has just done, she's made a suggestion, you're welcome to do that throughout the afternoon. Uh, well, within reason, of course. My plan is to drive around this... vicinity and see if we can't spot what was making some monkeys alarm call earlier. Let's just watch these two buffalo. They're either having a fight with each other or they've seen a predator. No, I think it's a fight with each other. But I have seen these buffalo chasing Karula around here. She slunk in down the bottom and underneath the dam there. That's what's going on. I think it might be just worth having a little look over the edge there. Now, Karula, for those of you who might be first-time watchers, is uh, our favorite leopard, basically. She's almost 12. She's about to have her 12th birthday. And she is the queen of Juma, and therefore the queen of Safari Live. So let's just have a stick our noses over the top here. I think it's these two old bulls, though, having a little argument about life. And what she does sometimes do is come through this area. She wanders along the dam, has a bit of a drink, gets chased out by the buffalo, and then she lies in the bushes here. A very beautiful dappled golden coat hidden by those quarry bushes. Anyway, I don't think she's in there at the moment. Now, while we wait and just see if there aren't any further alarm... <laughs> That buffalo is causing a lot of trouble. I'm just going to show you, for those of you who are keeping bird lists, and I know there are quite a few of you, the lark like bunting. And let's keep an eye out for him or her. They are the same. There is the lark like bunting. So it's a pretty nondescript bird, but for that very clear stripe over the top of the head and the stripe, what we'd call a moustachial stripe, down underneath the eye and next to the bill. 
It's also the bill is distinctly two-colored, pink on the bottom and gray on the top. Not common at all in this area. You can find them in other areas quite commonly, but not really here. So they will come in. They are nomadic, as I said. So that'll be a good one for the list, and I guarantee it. In fact, I'll be astonished if anybody has that on their list. We're going to try and get out of here. I'm going to drive down the road there a little bit, see if we can pick up on some tracks. Let's head across to Scott. He's looking around where Karula was this, uh, this morning, well, where her tracks were, and I'll catch up with you a little later. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Scott, and it's a great pleasure to have you on safari with me and also VM on camera. We've just stumbled upon a herd of elephants which are off to our left. I'm just trying to decide which is going to be our best spot to sit and wait for them to approach us that way, giving them the choice of how close they would like to come. And I've got a feeling that maybe just somewhere up ahead here, we may need to be patient for a little while to get good views. But like I say, the benefits of trying to guess where elephants are going to move can pay off greatly because that way, like I say, they can come quite close to you. Hmm. Reverse it. You can see a little bit of elephantine movement over there, a large ear flapping. That's one of the cows from the herd. I'm not too sure how big this herd is. Oh. Let me creep forward a bit. Let's just stay here for a second. And you'll notice that her temporal glands are weeping quite heavily. This is a great emotional indicator for elephants. And what exact emotions she is feeling, I cannot be certain just yet, but always good just to be wary of those individuals as they may be a little bit moody. It's quite a warm, muggy afternoon. Despite it being overcast, this cloud cover just started blocking out the sun literally about 15 minutes ago. But before that, we had baking sunshine. So don't be fooled by the cloudy weather. It is still hot and humid. and. That'll explain why this big elephant cow is fanning her ears at the rate which she is. It's in order to cool blood, which is pumped through her ears at an incredible rate, thus cooling down her core body temperature. We are in the general area of where we last had tracks of a female leopard this morning. I'm guessing it was Kurula and she will hopefully poke her head out at some stage. Failing that, maybe some of our local animal police force, the squirrels, the impalas, the monkeys, a lot of the animals which alarm call and help us hugely in finding predators will possibly find her before us, and that way we'll be able to hear them shouting and screaming, trying to call us there to get a better view of her. So that's what we're hoping for. We did also have some monkey alarm calls this morning north of the Juma Water. Also possibly another leopard lurking up there. Not sure who that could be. Maybe a Tingana, maybe that skittish nervous male that Brent saw uh, a few days ago. Sadly, none of you were on his vehicle. He was guiding some Juma guests. Um, but there could be another leopard lurking around that area. Other than that, updates, I'm not sure if James told you, the Inkohuma Pride are east of us on Torchwood, not too far from our eastern boundary, and they are with one of the Birmingham males who is apparently trying to make love with uh, apparently all of them, not just uh, anyone in specific, but they were not giving in to his intentions. So that's exciting prospects almost for tomorrow. They could well come back to Juma in the course of the night, and like I said, something to look forward to on the Sunrise Safari. So they have been found and established. We did have a little bit of fun tracking them. They skirted through the northeastern corner of Juma uh, last night and then straight out of our traverse area, sadly. Let me see what we should do with these elephants. They are slowly making their way towards us, but I'm not too sure where our best spot is going to be like us. So we might just need to be patient. 
this will do for now, I guess. This one big cow is slowly making her way towards us. And now you'll be getting better views of those weeping temporal glands. We saw a cow, was it yesterday afternoon, I think, that was heavily, heavily pregnant. I'm not sure if this is the same one, but it would be great if it is. That female is about to give birth, and I've never seen an elephant give birth. It would be a great privilege to watch an event like that unfold. And I think very few guides in a lifetime of guiding will not see something like that. What have you spotted there, Viam? Ah, Crested Franklin. And, oh, I did a little performance there for, for all of you. Like so many of the birds, they are really wonderful to look at, but it can be tricky unless they're close by to appreciate their beauty, but as you can see, that one has got exquisite feathers and coloration. She's got interesting tusks, this lady. One is much longer than the other, and they, one also grows inwards. And it, judging by those tusks, it doesn't look like the same elephant cow that was heavily pregnant yesterday. And on top of that, her belly, we can see, is not protruding as it should be if she was pregnant. But we are getting spoilt with some great views almost straight down her mouth here as she feeds. Using that incredibly complex tool, the trunk. To be able to break off these tasty morsels. Tando, <laughs> you just said, are we about to witness an Ellie birth? And I wish we were, but I don't think we are in the right spot just yet. We've got the wrong, the wrong Ellie. And I mean, the chances of getting it right are huge. I mean, they've got a 22 month gestation period. So to be there on the right day, after nearly two years of internal production, I guess emphasizes exactly how lucky you would be. Oh, a lot of you may be wondering where the rest of the Ellies are. They are slowly probably making their way towards us. I think VM may have spotted another crested Franklin there that he may have decided to go for, but it's, I think it's disappeared off into the undergrowth. The very, very sparse undergrowth. Look at how dry the ground is. I mean, not much to feed on you. Oh, you found some pugnacious ants. And these are quite nasty little critters. Look at how fast moving they are. And they do bite friendly sampling bites, nothing too serious, but they will latch onto you if you were to stand in a patch of those pugnacious ants for 30 seconds or so, they'll start climbing up your legs and giving you little, little nips. I think Nikki may have spotted a dung ball, which looked like, it, oh, well done, Nikki, you're right. Yeah, I missed that. So what would have happened here is, um, VM, if you just, pan upwards, you can see all that loose earth. That's where the dung ball would have been excavated from. So there you can see the hole in the ground. And an animal like a honey badger or possibly a white-tailed mongoose would have smelt that dung ball and the grub growing within it under the ground where the uh, adult dung beetle would have buried that bolus of dung with one egg in it, which would have matured into a larvae. And then either honey badger or mongoose would have smelt it, dug it out, broke open that ball of dung, and there you can see the open cavity where it would have pulled out the grub. Well spotted Ranger Austin. Thank you for your help there. The 
Okay, well, while we wait for a better view of this herd of elephants, which it will get it to at some point, we are going to send you to James, who's at a waterhole. Now, we've just come across here to the Gallagher waterhole to see if we couldn't find some tracks of the leopard. There are three more uh, beefalo bulls here. They are eating something quite interesting. Dave, can I ask you to just zoom in on what that buffalo is eating? Buffalo are known predominantly, of course, as grazers. But in an environment like this, that is not always possible because there's no grass. And he's eating a sort of quite aromatic herb at the moment. And I don't believe that that would be his first choice of food. You can see he's, he's not exactly devouring it. He's kind of eating it with long teeth, as it were. That, of course, is a very amusing joke, David, because buffalo don't have long teeth. That is quite interesting. Um, Boyd, a nice question in North Carolina. I'm going to come back to you in one second. We're just sitting here because there were some monkeys alarm calling around here after the sunrise drive. Now, I'm just sitting here to see if we can't hear anything further by way of alarm call. While I do that, Boyd, a nice question. You want to know about, you've obviously noticed that the buffalo sit with the hippo in that other water hole, and you say you found it quite interesting that the hippo tolerate the buffalo, given that you've heard and perhaps read that hippo are tremendously aggressive. Um, hippo are not aggressive per se. They are very easily threatened, Boyd. Uh, which means that they are highly dependent on water, and that means if, that if their water source is threatened, they will become extremely nasty very fast. Now, the arrangement there, the Juma water holes, has actually developed over a number of weeks. It started off with the hippo in there, and he wouldn't let anyone near the water for a little while, and the buffalo slowly kind of um, insinuated themselves on the situation, and eventually they were lying uh, sort of cheek by jowl, if you like, in a very friendly arrangement. So it has taken a bit of time to develop, and it's a fascinating little relationship that has developed. And I suspect as this drought wears on and the water becomes more concentrated, so we will see those sort of unusual relationships developing around food sources and around water sources. Very nice question. Thank you, Boyd. OK, we're going to carry on back down the road now and just keep a listen and see if we can't find some tracks for Karula. That buffalo is looking over the edge there, so I'm gonna go and look where he's looking. While I do that, let's go back across to Scott, who is still with the elephants. Welcome back, everyone. And it appears like we've got into a much better spot. That funny little beeping sound was just synchronizing the bundle of cameras in the bottom left of your screen, which is a virtual reality rig, which films 360 degrees. Now, this is the youngster of the elephant car that we have been viewing. And it looks like quite a little playful individual. When you're getting into position, we have to, oh, there we go. That's what I'm talking about. When we did a loop ahead and get back into a fortunate position here, where you can have a much better view of them. It was kind of trundling about from side to side. It looks like a young male. Hello, boy. Why don't you come and say hello to us? Hello to Snisha, who's watching in India. And <laughs> Wonderful to have you with us, Nisha. How cute is this little elephant? Quite different to your Indian elephants, and you are interested to know why are they so different? Why do they have such bigger ears than the Indian elephants? And Nisha, I'm not entirely sure. You guys have got hot weather out there as well, so hard for me to describe because, like I say, the weather climates are quite similar between India and Africa, as far as I'm aware. So it's something that I've thought about myself, but never been able to pinpoint settle down, lady. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. She just gave us a little bit of attitude, so due to that, we are going to head in the opposite direction because, to be honest, I don't want to have any 
cabman with a large elephant car this afternoon. And there's the whole herd seem to have heavily seeping and weeping temporal glands. I'm not sure if they've had a stressful scenario. Who knows, maybe with other animals, maybe with humans in the Kruger National Park elsewhere. Um, I'm not sure, but she did kind of give us a bit of action there. You didn't see it, but um, take my word for it. And it's important to just respect the animals, and if they're in a bad mood, leave them be. So, Snisha, like I say, I'm not too sure if any of you guys know why an Indian elephant would have a smaller ear than an African elephant. Please shed some light on it. I am not certain as to why that is the case. For the, for the African elephant, it's an it's a incredibly important thermoregulatory tool. And why the Indian elephants would not require that, I'm, I'm not too sure. theory that you've put forward um, saying that African elephants will typically not have as much cover uh, to move in and that's not to say it's not very hot in the jungles that they move in so yes I agree sunshine may not be a problem for Indian elephants but heat still is India is a hot and humid country Snisha correct me if I'm wrong not hugely dissimilar to parts of Africa where African elephants move. This is a really big old warthog. He doesn't have the hugest tusks, but I think he is on the old age. Ooh, just hit a squirrel alarm call. Is, well, there was a second warthog earlier before we came across this herd of elephants, and I think it is. Oh, uh, yeah, you can just see it moving in the background there behind that dead bush. That one is an incredibly fine specimen. He's a big boy. So if we get to see that other one that is behind there, we'll be in luck. So, Leon, yes, uh, 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 your theory is certainly plausible, but it's a heat thing. It's not a sunshine thing, and even in tropical jungles of India, it gets warm. So I'm not convinced that that is necessarily myth-busted. Let's see if we can creep forward a little bit. Yeah, I'm just, the other one's about to pop out there, I think. Look at the size of those tusks. He is a brute. The one in the back. And even his body did appear bigger than what I think is an old male that's kind of beginning to wither away. Interestingly, you'll notice that he's feeding on his elbows. And I guess it's just a lot more comfortable for Warthog, having their neck at a easier incline as they nibble on the very short roots and grass. Now he's standing up. Good. I just had one little squirrel alarm call, nothing too serious, up in this direction, possibly for a bird of prey, can't be certain. Kruger guy, you have mentioned aren't most elephants born at night? Nope, not that I've heard, but uh, maybe that is the case. What we need to remember um, is, just like humans, animals can't 
decide when it's going to suit them to give birth, maybe up to a very slight degree. Um, but when it's time for the baby to come, it comes. Come night, day, rain or sh shine. Um, you know, it's, I think it's fair to say that not many animals, there's rumors that impala can hold back their pregnancy, but the key word there is rumors, it is not true. Um, it would be biologically quite a fascinating scenario if any animal could decide when it wanted to give birth. And I don't think there are many that can decide to when and when, or at least mammals, when they can decide to do that. Thank you to James Taylor, who's been doing some research for all of us, and hugely grateful for that, James. Apparently, in general, India is cooler. It's humid, possibly more humid than Africa in those rainforests and jungles that occur there. But it's not hotter, so it's merely an evolutionary thing when ele uh, African elephants here may have grown to become bigger, to become a better cooling device. And Indian elephants, who knows, maybe they stayed the same size as the original elephants, or maybe they got smaller. But it's an evolutionary adaption, so thank you for that. Virginia, you would like to know if young elephants will ever be inquisitive and come up to the vehicles. Yes, most certainly. They come sometimes come charging right up to what we call the bonnet of the vehicle or the hood of the vehicle to show us how big and strong they are. Um, and sometimes even the big adults will come in and sniff around, inquisitive of our sm smells emanating from the vehicle. So yes, most certainly we've had all the presenters have had some really moving experiences with elephants, big and small, coming very, very close to the vehicle. So sometimes you get lucky in, in today's scenario, Virginia, that elephant car was not in the most welcoming of moods. But that very same elephant on another day could be a lot more relaxed and a lot more welcoming. So that's an important thing to remember with animals, just like humans, people will react differently on different days, different occasions. So you can never assume that you can treat one animal the same way on a daily basis. Good. We are going to send you across to James, who has found a magnificent spiral horned antelope. This is a very shy spiral horned antelope, of course, Mrs. Spiral horned antelope, the kudu. Female, beautiful cow there, covered in oxpeckers and hiding behind a bush. She wasn't at all bashful until you came across, so she's obviously very shy. She knew when we gone, had gone live. She's now hiding. Let's just reverse a bit and try and get a better view of her. She won't be alone. I think there are a few of them in here. Yes. There are also some buffalo grazing off into this woodland. Now, while we look at her, just an interesting thing, I use the term woodland, which is not something a lot of people associate with Africa, especially those who've watched the documentaries that come out of East Africa and that sort of thing. You associate Africa with savanna, vast swathes of grassland with the odd acacia tree poking its nose up. Here in the eastern parts of South Africa, it's largely what we call woodland. And this is called a broadleafed or combretum woodland. And that's why we get so many things like kudu and nyala and bushbuck and the other browsing antelope, also dica, which you wouldn't perhaps get nearly as much of in an area where there was more grass and less in the way of woody species. Now, De Deborah. A very salient question, which Desiree, sorry, you're in, in, in Indiana. You say that, David, after, after a day in the sun in Indiana. Desiree, you want to know about quarantine. And 
it's a term we throw out all over the time, all the time, and it's an area. Yes, you're absolutely correct. It's an area of land. It's a clearing off to the east of where we're sitting now, where it's just it's a good place to drive around. It's, a, it's an artificial clearing in that it has been cleared by people, and it looks much more like a savanna area. But it's called quarantine clearings because I think at one stage there was a boma, which is a kind of um, protective cage or wooden cage that they'd put animals in in order to quarantine them before introduction into the wild. And that's why it's called quarantine clearings. Very good question, and I must keep remembering to explain that because I'm sure it must be very strange if you are a new viewer and you don't know what quarantine clearings is to hear that we are going to quarantine. You must think that we all have some kind of a disease that we need to get rid of periodically. That is not the case. Well, not as far as I'm aware, anyway. Okay, we're going to carry on driving along here. This is, this is very wonderful to hear. Sam, you're in Holland, and you say it's your first time watching the stream and you're having a good time. I'm so pleased. But you also say that you sometimes find it a little bit difficult to understand. Well, I'm sorry about that. We would attempt to speak clearly and with clarity. But I must just say, Sam, that your fellow countrymen, of all the European nations that I used to drive when I was a guide, I found them the most amazing speakers of languages. They always spoke a number of different languages that weren't their own, and I've always been tremendously impressed by the language skills of Dutch people, Sam. So please keep watching and send us any questions, and if there's anything you don't understand that we say, you're more than welcome to ask us to clarify it. of course I say this quite often the Twitter handles that people have amuse me to no end and Anne T. Lope uh, you want to know what my favorite antelope is well Anne T. Lope I can actually answer that my favorite antelope is the Nyala I think they are the most magnificent I enjoy the bulls and their fluffy charcoal gray coats with stripes and their strange sort of um, mane of white hair that go all the way down their backs. I find them fascinating to watch. I think that rich red chestnut color of the females is really stunning. So they're my favorite antelope, the Nyala. Antelope. Antelope, could you perhaps tell us where your Twitter hand comes from? Are you a great antelope fan? Crossing into Tortured, that's my man. Now, if we look over here, David, if you wouldn't mind, at this large tree here, um, I'm pleased to note, first of all, that we have found already more heartbeats than we did in three hours this morning, so I'm feeling slightly relieved. Uh, this particular organism that we're looking at doesn't have a heartbeat because it is a tree, and we know trees don't have heartbeats, as far as we're aware. And the reason I've come past here is that I just had a feeling that maybe Karula would be in this tree because this is the most perfect leopard tree on Juma. It is called a jackalberry, or Diaspirus mespeloformes, and what it has got now are its new leaves. And it's what we call a semi-deciduous tree. You can see that its foliage is not very thick, and that means that it will lose its leaves at sort of periodically throughout the year. Ooh, listen to that. Did you hear that, Dave? thunder rolling across the plains. Oh, that's a nice sound. I do hope it brings some rain. Anyway, this tree loses its leaves in a sort of random haphazard fashion. And whenever it, the conditions are not very good, like they have been good now, I suspect it's probably, it's taking a very long time to get its new leaves. And I suspect it's probably putting not much emphasis on making new leaves at the moment, you'll probably find the tree is in a state of dormancy. And a huge tree like this, in times of trouble or times of tough, like we're having now, and like we're probably going to continue to have, it will actually sacrifice a limb. So you'll find one of those huge branches, perhaps that one off to the right there that's looking a bit sparsely leafed. Perhaps that will be sacrificed. The tree will simply cut off circulation to that part of the tree, and it will die off. 
And I just find that astonishing. We tend to think of plants as being, well, kind of unintelligent and unconscious, which they may well be, but they certainly have evolved remarkable strategies to cope with living out here in the wilderness. I was just hoping there might be a leopard in there. There isn't, so we're going to turn round and continue down, basically towards the tracks where, where the tracks were this morning. <laughs> Lisa, uh, you've got some advice for Sam. Uh, Sam, Lisa says, don't, uh, don't eat any leaves that I might offer you. Lisa, that's not very kind. But interestingly, Lisa, I mean, in part, I know you're not being completely serious, well, maybe you are, but there's actually so little at the moment that is, is worth trying to eat because it's, all because it's all dry and nasty. And, of course, we had Gracie in Ohio saying to me, please don't eat the leaves, of course, because the animals need to eat the leaves. And I must heed, I must heed the requests of Gracie in Ohio. So we won't be doing much eating of the leaves. Good point. Thank you, Nicola, for reminding me of that. Oh, brilliant. Now, Monique, you're in London, and you want to see a wildebeest today. Well, that's an unusual request. It's a very good request. Wildebeest are, I think, highly entertaining. They're very interesting animals. And you say you were watching the Pete's Pond Feed yesterday. The Pete's Pond Feed is in Mashatu, which is just across the Botswana border from here. And you say you saw a wildebeest hanging about with some zebra and you want to know if that's common, does it happen often, you thought you saw it twice. Your eyes are not deceiving you, Monique, you're probably very correct indeed. A wildebeest bull, remember, is a solitary creature and what he does is he has sets up a territory uh, which normally has three things. He's normally got a rubbing post in it, he'll have a midden and he'll have a good shade tree in, in, the, in his little territory. It's a very small postage stamp sized territory, it's even smaller in East Africa and then he will try and herd the lady wildebeest into that territory when it's time for mating. But if it isn't time for mating, he's on his own. And of course, that's a dangerous thing for any animal to be out here. And so often you will find single wildebeest bulls mixing with herds of zebra or maybe even mixing with impala herds. Often we see them with impala around here. So that's not unusual. Then in East Africa, where you get those massive herds of wildebeest, two million of them streaming across the plains as the year goes on during the Great Migration. And you'll find coming either in front of them, in fact, normally in front of them, will be the zebra. Have I got that right? No, just behind them will be the zebra. Because the zebra eats slightly shorter grass. And that means that the wildebeest go through an area, they mow the grass to a good height for the zebra, and then the zebra will eat them. But I think you'll find that the, the reason that single bull was with the herd of zebra was because he was seeking out protection from their extra eyes. Nice one. Thank you, Monique. We have another request for an animal it's today. <laughs> oh, gosh. Donna. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> mm. so, <laughs> some of you may have been watching a little while back and you saw Brian and I do a rain dance, the original rain dance with jean Dre and I and Donnie, you say, because I have said, well, you can request anything within reason, um, you'd ask to see another rain dance. I'm going to try and convince Dave and Sam that they should join me for a rain dance by the end of the drive. And um, we'll see what happens. I, I, you know, I think that's on the edge of what is a, a reasonable request and what isn't. Dave's gone pale. Sam just jumped off the vehicle and ran off into the bush. I don't think we'll see him again. <laughs> oh, goodness. Hello, Sean. You're in Secunda. And... <laughs> 
to know how many languages I can speak and can I give you an example of each? Well, I can speak a bit of English, and I'm generally giving an example of that most of the time. Then I can speak, well, I should be able to speak better Afrikaans than I can. Afrikaans, of course, is the other European-based language here, derived from Dutch, a very simple version of Dutch. And I can a bit of Afrikaans praat, but as I Afrikaans praat, Afrikaners think I praat Afrikaans so as, so as, um, I'm not going to continue that sentence because it was about to get bad. Uh, but basically that's Afrikaans and I said that I don't speak it very well and Afrikaans speaking people uh, don't think I speak it very well and with good reason. And then I can, um, I dabble with Zulu. Oh, and there's a water buck. I will uh, give you this little, um, I'll give you this little sighting in Zulu, shall we? So we would say, Zi amagama yezilwani yama, i watabak, gumbe amapiva, amapiva atanda gushambe mati imanzini. That means the water buck like to swim in the water. So that's what it would be in Isi Zulu. Now, if we said the same thing in Shangan, which is the other language I dabble in, we would say, Tipi Valitia. Terranza Gushamba Ematini. That would be the same thing. The water buck over here like to swim in the water. Tijabzani. They eat grass. And there are some difficult words in those in two indigenous languages that obviously the Zulu, the most obviously difficult thing are the clicks, if you are not used to them. A cue is An X is as if you were trying to make a horse go. And a C is as if you were not very happy with some of these actions. And then the difficult one in Shangan is this kind of It's like a whistling, a whistling Z. So you say Zani, which means grass. Zani, Zagubtuka, which means the red grass. Okay, that's enough of that nonsense. Let's head across to Scott. He's with a small pony. Karibuni ya punda ya muti. Mimi napenda. Hizi punda. Kwa sabu. Na ikona Karibu ya barabarani, alafu, ikona rangi m, ni mzuri. Rangi is colors in Kiswahili. That is the language I've been speaking in. And I'm told that you and James have been chatting in Isi Zulu. My Kiswahili is awfully rusty. And as I was speaking there, I was scratching for certain words. But their name is Punda in Kiswahili. And Nikki reassures me that don't worry, you all noticed that I was really battling to string the sentence together there. <laughs> but isn't this a cute little zebra? It's certainly got a prance about it when it runs off in front of its mother. And I'm not sure if James has heard any thunder across where he is traversing on Juma, but there is some thunder rumbling in the distance. So maybe, just maybe, we are going to get lucky and we're going to get some rain. Although the clouds aren't looking as gloomy as I'd like them to. No further sign of Kurula, the queen of Juma, a leopardess who we were tracking in this area just to the right of us this morning. So I'm not too sure where she has disappeared to. I did just hear some Franklins take off in a great terror. Chip, 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 chip. So they got a fright from something. Maybe it was her on the move. But only time will tell.
Hello to James Dungan. You would like to know if we see any gazelles in this part of Africa. And no, we don't see any gazelles here. There's a Thompson's gazelle and Grant's gazelle that occur in large numbers up in East Africa. But they don't come this far south. The springbok is a gazelle that's similar to the Thompson's and Grant's gazelle that we see here. It is the emblem for our South African rugby team, the Springbok. And it is also the name of them. Let's see if these horn bulls aren't going to do their fancy call for us. It looks like they're warming up to it. BM was trying to keep both in frame because they can hold out their wings and do a really fancy display. Maybe they are trying to call in this rain. I can also hear a squirrel alarm calling off to our left, so I'm scanning off in the bush in that direction. Not sure what they've seen. Come on! Oh, no. This is the yellow-billed hornbill, very distinctive, large yellow bill. They've got a cousin called the red bull that also occurs in this area. Let's carry on. I don't think we're going to get to see their call. I just want to see what the squirrel has seen. It's interestingly letting off a call that indicates that it's been doing it for quite a while. It's not like all of a sudden got a big fright. It's just reminding everything in this area that there's some kind of danger here. You could almost imagine being tired of shouting and screaming after the initial shock of finding anything dangerous. And it's just doing like a maintenance call now, you could almost say. Where is it? You'll be able to hear it. Somewhere, I think, in this marula tree. They have been taking me on quite a few wild chases, the tree squirrels of this area. Oh, no, hang on, VM, check the, the hornbill that's just landed in the tree on the left. You got it there? Just, just zoom straight in, it's in the center of your shot there at the lower end of this marula. Yeah, there we go, lower, left, there. It's dropping into the nest, there we go. And that will explain exactly what the problem was, and that is that it is not a squirrel that is calling, it is the baby hornbills that I'm getting confused with. And they are in that cavity, begging the parents for food. There's the cavity there on the, on the marula tree. In that hole is where the noise is coming from, so apologies. And I got stumped by a baby hornbill, but wasn't it great that we got to see it feeding? They've got a fascinating nesting regime, and that is that the females will enclose themselves within that cavity and they'll use mud and excrement to just create a very thin coin slot that only allows the males to feed in little bugs to them. Once they've done a full feather molt, incubated the eggs and they've hatched, they've tended to them for a few days, they then break out and leave the youngsters in the nest, and then both male and female will tend to the feeding of them. Could be their second, actually, uh, second clutch of the summer. Hi there, Jackson, and as the thunder rumbles in the distance, you would like to know if animals are more active before a storm. Some animals, yes, are certainly more active. I know harvested termites can be good indicators that rain is coming. They will get as much little grass pieces and stuff that they can into their subterranean homes. So yes, so harvested termites are active. Mammal-wise, not that I've really noticed. You may find some birds moving towards rain or some animals that may have this uncanny ability to predict rain or know where it may rain may move into those areas. But uh, I've never noticed any stark differences between animals' behavior before rain. After rain, yes. 
They can run around jumping for joy, uh, literally showing incredible happiness. And it'll be emphasized now because of the drought conditions we're experiencing. Any little drops of rain are going to make any of the mammals and a lot of the animals very happy. The birds will start singing. Speaking of happy animals, you wouldn't believe what the Inkahuma pride and the one Birmingham male got up to in the course of the day. They killed a buffalo. Um, again, to the east of our property, that is what Brent is enjoying watching now. Um, obviously, nobody got to see the action, except for the lions themselves. Let me just ask Brent if it was a big buffalo. Thank you. Uh, myself and Bernie. That will be interesting. Can I join? I'm guessing it was a big cape buffalo, uh -huh. but a big bull, but maybe not. Uh, Brent, was it a buffalo bull? Negative, uh, Scott. It's a, a cow, and so they've just taken the features out Okay, copy, thanks. Okay, so it's not a bull. I was wrong. Yeah, it's a cow. Just a quick summary. And as you may have heard Brent saying, she was heavily pregnant and he's just pulled, the lines have just opened her up and pulled the fetus out. So unfortunate for her. But it is a reality, uh, heavily pregnant females do become targets for the predators for obvious reasons, they can't move as quickly carrying that large baby around in their belly. Hello, Tony in London, and you'd like to know how efficient our communication is with surrounding camps and lodges. It's a tricky question. I'm not tricky, but it's basically it's not as good as it should be. Um, but um, it's there's there's varying degrees of uh, varying channels of communication, Tony. Basically, there's a WhatsApp group that most guides in the Sabi Sands are on, and that's for the entirety of the Sabi Sands. And it's really useful, but it's mainly for lion updates, wild dog updates, and cheetah updates. Not so much leopard because those are more localized movements and for specific areas of the Sabi Sands, more specific areas of the Sabi Sands. Um, so the, the update group that caters for the entire Sabi Sands, like I say, is for mainly lion and wild dog, animals that roam far and have big impacts on one another. The one pride obviously has an impact on the other pride. The one coalition of dominant males has an impact on the other dominant coalition of males. So we've got fairly good understanding of where most of the, the prides of lion are, even some that we will never see in our whole careers here. Um, but with surrounding properties that even neighbor us, we've, we, we don't have uh, at the moment the best communications. Um, you know, sometimes animals can cross into Juma and, and we don't get the messages uh, at all until maybe on that WhatsApp group or somebody sends us an SMS. So it's not as slick and efficient as we'd like it to be, but I'm sure it will get there at some point. There have been lots of changes from an analog radio system. Now some people have got a digital radio system. So um, it's basically not, not as slick as it could be. And that's the reason why sometimes we'll miss out on sightings. I mean, even the fact that we've got the Arethusa Game Drive channel at the moment, we can hardly hear the guys when we go across there. So it's a reality that we could be there and a sighting could unfold and we could know nothing about it. Looks like we may be in luck with a little bit of rain. There's some eerie colors and clouds out to the west. Let's hope they keep coming towards us. James Taylor, you would like to know if we ever have tornadoes in South Africa. Not really, no. Um, sometimes Mozambique has cyclones. Cyclones and tornadoes are essentially the same thing. I think they're just called different things in different hemispheres or different parts of the world, essentially. 
Um, but no, we are incredibly fortunate in South Africa. We don't have many natural disasters, earthquakes, tornadoes, uh, you know, we, we're quite lucky with regards to those kinds of things here and we'll seldom experience them. If so, it may, it may just be a tiny little dust devil here and there or a little bit of a windier day than normal, but nothing, nothing too serious. There's a very pretty bird perched up on the dead tree. Hello, lilac breasted roller. And, oh, look at this, VM, straight ahead of us in the dead tree. Yeah. Just straight ahead of us in the dead tree. If you zoom in, you'll see. That's, sorry, more to the right. That's more, more to the right of that. If you keep going, there's. Sorry, Vim. Yeah, that one. Uh... Now I'm not sure if this is the same Marshall eagle, but it is in fact a Marshall eagle, the same bird that we did see this morning, flying off with a monitor. Oh. What has it got there? It was just a hornbill flying below it. Um, station, just to make you aware, there'll be a stuff happening in the Wallawaki. But we did see a Marshall Eagle with a monitor lizard kill this morning. Not the closest visual, but at least we did get to see it then and now. And that is one of the aerial kings of Juma. Two and a half meter wingspan the ability to be able to catch baby impala. It is a formidable animal. There's some rain. Vim has found for you guys. It's way off in the distance, but it may, if we're lucky, continue out to us here on Juma. Fingers crossed. We're going to send you back to James now and continue our search for anything exciting. We now are on the western kind of frontiers of Juma. Buffalo kill, Torchwood, Brentley Smith. I'm struggling to contain my sense of jealousy. Maintain my decorum in the face of such a thrilling event that occurred so close to us, and yet we were unable to see it. Anyway, such is the way of things in the wilderness. We are on the Cheetah Cut Line, heading north towards the northeastern corner of Juma, and they were then going to head to the east, to the west. Can't head east of here. Well, we can, but it's illegal. We're going to head west from here towards Sydney's Dam and see if we can't find some elephants or something going on there. The last two times Scott has been there, he's managed to find all sorts of things. Now, Jackson, you're on Twitter. You want to know what happens when it rains to the roads. Do they become mired and muddy and impossible to drive on? Jackson, it really does. This is not a facetious answer. It really depends on how much water we get. So if you have more than 20 millimeters, which would be considered an inch, you can get quite a lot of mud, quite a lot of puddles. But on this land, which is granitic soils, so the underlying uh, rock type here is granite, and so the soils are normally sandy and fairly well drained, the chances of getting a really muddy area where you could get stuck are, are small. Some parts of the Sabi sands also are underlain by a rock called gabbro, and that makes a much thicker, what we call black cotton soil. And then after 20 millimeters of rain or so, yes, you can get stuck just driving along the road. So it really does depend on the soil type and the amount of rain that we have. Here on Juma, I think we'd be pretty much okay with almost any amount of rain. I think certainly up to at least 100 millimeters or so, which would be just under five inches would be absolutely fine driving on the roads. This dust that you can see now is completely unseasonal. We shouldn't be getting dust now. It's normally a completely dust-free time of the year. and normally little puddles all over the place with frogs in them and other interesting little creatures, but not this year, unfortunately. And as sure as Scott was showing you, uh, there seems to be some rain sort of further in the east towards the mountains. 
I don't believe it's going to get here, and that has been the status of things this year. Those big clouds build, not as big as they were, or in a normal year without the El Nino effect, and they just kind of dissipate by the time they hit this part of the world. We'll get up to a high point here, and you'll be able to see the storm coming in. on the bandwagon, Tony. It's really, it's unbecoming. You, you, you say, can we finish our rain dance today with some Zulu stamping and that we would look very nice in grass skirts? Um, well, Tony, uh, I'm of the opinion that unless you can do something well, you shouldn't really do it at all. And um, I am a very poor Zulu dancer. I think I was taught three steps once. And so if I'm, I can repeat them again and again, if you'd like. Um, I'm certainly not going to do it in a grass skirt, though. That would be very frightening indeed, especially for our younger viewers. In fact, it, well, they wouldn't even have to be younger viewers. It would still be terrifying. and get to a spot where we can see this storm nicely. But again, I just want you to look around and see how these leaves are going yellow, they're going autumnal colors. At a time when everything should be a verdant green. Then we go down the slope to where there's a little bit more water under here and everything's a bit more green. We go back up again and you can see the yellow begins. a little dwarf mongoose, little dwarf mongoose. Did you see it there? Yeah, it's just gone round the... It's just gone round the termite mound there. We'll just, while I... We'll, we'll see if he'll pop his head up while I answer the question of Raffy Pipe. Hello, Raffy Pipe. There's the dwarf mongoose. Ah, Rusty Pipe, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Rusty pipe. You <laughs> um, sorry, before I get to your question, Rusty pipe, Nikki reckons she can spot a lizard. Center frame under the two sticks. Ah, there is two. It's a plated lizard. Nicola, that's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Can you see what she's looking at, Dave? Not quite, James. Um, if you see the you see the base of the dead stick there, or the dead stump, yeah. right? If you go just down and to the right of that, you will see a kind of goldish sheen. You got it there? Uh, you're on it. I mean, you are on it. Mm. It's, it's not moving and it's not, it's not helping. Now, right, all right. While Dave tries to find that, we'll just see if it is actually a lizard. I'll actually get out and see if it'll move just now. Uh, rusty pipe. You want to know about termites and do they uh, her harm man-made structures out here? Rusty pipe, uh, normally we don't build with wood here, you see. Uh, most, in fact, 99% of South African houses are built with brick, which precludes um, attacks from termites, which is good. But termites do get into furniture, they do get into decking, certainly, and the lodges around here have extensive decking often, and they definitely have to be treated for termites. But other, we don't have the same problem. I know in North America, as far as I'm aware, you do have tremendous issues with termites actually getting into your walls, into your homes. Uh, we don't have that problem here because we don't tend to build in wood. Now, David, will you zoom in exactly as you were to the base of the dead, thickest dead stump that you can see? There's some lightning over there. Don't worry, we're okay, everyone. I know that you're terrified for our safety. Now, watch that little bit of gold and I'll see if it is actually a lizard. It will move if I approach it. And if it doesn't, I shall point it out with a stick. It is a lizard, I see from here. Nicola Austin, that's an absolutely brilliant spot. 
from the final control, she saw this plated lizard. He is a magnificent fellow. He's black, gold, <laughs> and a bit brown. He's called a giant, it's not a, I don't know if he's a giant plated lizard. He's going to go down into the termite mound now. Did you see him? Did you get him, Dave? <laughs> he didn't see him. Okay, I'll just show you the hole he went into. He went down in here. He's lying over here, and we could just see him poking out through there. And he was lying here. This is his little day bed. You can see he's laying here before. And he went down into the mound there. Brilliant. <laughs> this is astonishing. I've often said to Nicola, you know, she should do some presenting. She kind of giggles bashfully and says, oh, but I just don't know that I'd have enough knowledge. Um, I think she'd be rather good at it, so maybe you should tell her, encourage her on Twitter, hashtag SafariLive, where it's WildEarth.tv, if you feel that Nicola Austin should take a drive. She's going to kill me for that. Sunisa, you're in India, and I really, I'm so pleased to hear from somebody in India where I think some of the world's most beautiful wildlife lives. Sunisa, you say, what would we do to help the animals if the drought continues and starts to harm them? Sunisa, that's a difficult question. The answer probably is not very much. We're in a very large open system. It's 8 million acres, that's 3.5 million hectares, and short of pumping much too big. Sorry, I know we went a little bit black screen there. Um, it's much too big for us to start feeding animals. So we couldn't bring in feeding animals, although I have actually seen a few trucks driving in here. But for the entire region, of course, that would be totally impossible. Now, the big thing to remember here is that if there is not a natural of animals during a drought season like this. What happens is that there becomes the browse grazes becomes a little weave. Sorry. What we're going to do, everybody, there's a lot of audio jumping and visual jumping at the moment because we're going through this dip. I'm going to speed through that dip at a great speed. And the other side, we will continue this conversation. Um, a good idea for animals. So as I was saying, 
If we provide, for example, waters, it's a little bit more easy to provide because you can dig a well and you can dig a, wall, a borehole and pump water. What happens then is that the browse and the graze get over, gets overpressurized. The next time rain comes along, you create a major problem for erosion. And so, as painful as it may be, and it will be painful, if this carries on like it is, it's not going to be easy for anyone, not for us watching, and not for us presenting, not for you watching, not for the animals concerned. But it may be that we have to let nature take its course. It'll be great for the carnivores. It will not be very pleasant for the herbivores. That's just the way it's going to be. Now, we have a wildebeest. There was a crest of a wildebeest. Let's head across to him now. Ah, oh, Monique in London. Ask and you shall receive. Here's a big wildebeest bull, and I'm hoping he is going to continue to do his territorial. Here we go. Look at this. His territorial marking and displays. You won't be able to see very clearly now, but there's a strong chance he's urinating as well as defecating in that spot where he scraped his hoof. He's done that once since we've seen him, and then another time with you now. And hopefully we'll get to see him doing it again. He doesn't appear to have any ladies in tow, so maybe he's an older boy who's lost his way with the ladies. Which asks the big question, well, then why is he bothering trying to allocate or mark this area for his territory? I'm not too sure. Let's see if we can creep a little bit closer. I'm not sure if the storm is any creeping any closer, but the thunder is still rumbling out to the west. Sadly, it appears like the rain could be drifting in an easterly direction south of our area. So I'm not convinced we are going to catch any of it, sadly. But only time will tell. These storms can change direction and movement very quickly, and next thing you know, they'll be upon us. Hmm, I think we're going to have to stop here. I hope that we'll be able to get you a few more views of the wildebeest. Maybe one more dusty display as he scrapes his hoof. No luck. Hello, Wolf Bernard. You would like to know what the difference is between a blue and a black wildebeest? Well, as the name suggests, the color is different. The blue wildebeest has this bluey uh, kind of tinge to it, and the black wildebeest has a more black coloration. It also has more white on its tail and its beard. Let me just get the pictures out for you to show you exactly what they look like. So here's the black wildebeest, white on the tail, white on the mane, and considerably smaller than a blue wildebeest. Let's check the weight here. 100 to 180 kilograms. And the blue wildebeest is 250 kilo, oh, 180 to 250 kilograms, so almost kind of twice the size and lacks the white. The black wildebeest also lacks these brindles that you can see when the sunlight connects the blue wildebeest correctly, I think. Yeah, it does lack the brindles. Hence the name also sometimes being the brindle gnu. The horns are also a slightly different shape, I guess, different horn structure to a degree. And they also do not uh, overlap in any areas of South Africa, or they shouldn't. Uh, nowadays, with people buying and moving game as they please, you may find some reserves with both on them, private reserves with both animals on them, but technically, they did not ever overlap prior to us getting involved. Monique, it's a great pleasure. I'm happy that that wildebeest stumbled onto the scene to help us fulfill your request. 
and the animals are coming out from all angles. James has just found you some more talk. Look, a little piggy walking across this clearing. Also irritated by the flies, as am I, using his tail, using his little feet to hit the flies off his face. Her face, sorry. It's a little sow. Not sure you can call a little pig like that a sow. It's not nearly cute enough word. Let me just go back a bit. And you can see the storm building there. Asking about sorry about the signal issues I'm sure it's the fact that there's a huge amount of electromagnetic radiation in the air as a result of the lightning that is steaming in I think that might actually be the incorrect physical term let's just say electricity anyway Tim you want to know if a warthog's tusks which that one does not have well the females got little tusks and the little ones don't have any tusks are the same as the ivory in elephant tusks. Tim, I suppose chemically probably not very different, but you can't, it doesn't sort of work like ivory does, certainly. And so I think we're just going to let them gently walk off into the distance there. And so Tim, no, they're not hunted for their ivory like elephants would be. Um, and certainly it's not, I don't think it's illegal at all to trade in, in a warthog tusks. But they don't. It's not. It's not the same. Leaving one station with. Uh, we don't have great signal here, so let's just try and move slowly, and then Dave will just show you the amazing cloud formations. Look at that. That's stunning, and you can see there is some rain coming out of the sky there, and further to the south of that, there you can see some lightning. Now, Dave, what I'm going to challenge you with here is that European roller. I want to see if you can get some, um, you see the European roller there? It's that turquoise bird sitting out on the tree there. There he is. And then there's some lightning behind him if you look carefully. There, beautiful bird. Look at that subtle color. See the lightning there? Now, Nicola, of course, who remembers all sightings that have ever been seen here at Wild Earth, says that a few months ago, Scott had some zebra standing probably in this clearing with the lightning going behind. Oh, look at that. So that is to the southwest of us. And the lightning would normally come in from the west, sometimes the northwest. If we're going to get a proper storm, it'll come in from the northwest. So I don't think that's going to dump any rain on us. But somebody, some blessed, some group of blessed people is receiving rain now. And this European roller will fly home to Europe at some stage into various parts of southern Europe um, as our autumn comes. He might leave early this year, given the parlous state of his insect food. And then he will attempt to avoid the bird shooting hunters, which of course uh, abound in southern Europe during migration time. Uh, he doesn't want to end up in an Italian pasta. And hopefully he'll be back here next year. And I say that because I've had a guest, as I think I've said to you before, where there was a, an Italian guest and I said, look, there's a European roller. And he didn't speak much English, of course. And he said, ah, yes, delicious in the pasta. Uh, I said, but it's a European roller. It's not a chicken or a turkey. He said, no, they eat them. Isn't he lovely? And he'll be hunting from that little perch. Beautiful lightning behind him. I think that's just fantastic. Preening, that preening process that they do all the time is so important for keeping the barbs and barbules and barbicels of the feathers all nicely lined up for flight. Okay, let's, I'm going to head to Sydney's Dam. I'm not far from there. Scott's got an impressive male version of the large stripy antelope we saw earlier. I'll see you at the dam. Well, this is not an impressive male kudu that we were hoping to show you. But still, a pretty antelope, and he will get there eventually. 
His horns are about half as big as they will be when he will be considered majestic. Let's see if we can't get you some views of the bigger members of this bachelor herd, which are just a little bit ahead of him. It's quite thick here, so it is going to be tricky, but worth a try. I think this little gap is going to be as good as it gets. There is one that is going to pop out to the right of that green bush in the center of your screen. So let's just be patient for a second or two. I can see it's spindly legs. There's another one further to the left there. There's a couple through here. Come on. Here he comes. I couldn't copy your name, but one of you would like to know, is there another name for spiral horned antelope? And not, not that I know of, um, but there may be. Oh, tour, tour pro. Um, so, no, not that I know of. Let me check in the book here if it says anything interesting about them, but I don't think that this book will be able to furnish us with any info on it. Worth a check, though. The eland is the largest of these spiral horned antelope. Now, no, eland, bongo, kudu, inyala, sitatunga, and bushbuck. One, two, three, four, five, six species make up the spiral horned antelope. And it says here in brackets at the end, spiral horned antelope. Thus, part of the Tragilephony tribe. But that's all it says there. These are some giant eland or Lord Derby's eland. We only get them in Central Africa and West Africa. So I've never seen one of these, but they're very, very pretty, almost a cross between a kudu and a regular eland, which is what we see here. This is a common eland. Lacks the vertical white stripes, but still has the spiral horns. They are ginormous. They weigh up to just about a ton, the big males. And this is a bongo. They are such cool animals. They too are huge. Males up to 300 kilograms. It's like an Inyala on steroids. It's like a Jaguar version of a... Exactly, it's like a Jaguar version of a leopard. That is a great description. Beam, the wildebeest, thank you. So that was number th Then the kudu. This is the greater kudu, which are the species we got a glimpse of now. Up in East Africa, you get the lesser kudu, which has got more white stripes on their body. Let's do a quick count, actually. So we'll count this one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 12. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Yeah, so I mean, it'll maybe vary, uh, but the greater kudu have got less stripes than the lesser kudu, and the lesser kudu are smaller. Then, mountain Nyala. Sheesh, where do you find these? In Ethiopia. Very limited highland area. Kirsty, thank you, you rocket scientist. You said they live in the mountains, the mountains of Ethiopia. I was looking for something more specific than that, Kirsty. But let's take a look on the map of Africa. Tiny little blob. So the mountain and yarn is a rare species. Then we get the regular Nyala. This is what we see here. The Bambis of the African wilderness with their little white spots on their bottom, all these white stripes here on their body. Very nice. And then the smallest of all of the spiral horn antelope. Oh, no. Sorry. Not yet. The Sitatunga. We're on the way there. We're getting there. You get these in very wet areas. And what you can't see in any of these pictures is their hoof type. But you can see it living in the water here. They usually live in very thick reeds and swamps. And they've got specially designed hooves, which you can see here they are Long, those are eight centimeters long, 80 millimeters, and splay very wide so that they can try and 
keep, a, not afloat, but at least above the surface of the water when they are moving through it. And last but not least, the bushbuck, the smallest of the spiral horned antelope, which we also get here. So we get three out of the six here at Juma. Not too bad, really. We are missing a couple. The eland, the bongo, and the sitatunga, essentially, and the various different races of Inyala, I guess. Come on the rain! Well, Mr. Henry has now decided to try and find his crocodile. He owns it. He should give it a name as he was the one that discovered it, at least out of the safari live crew. I guess everyone else who could drive close to Sydney's Water Hole knew that crocodiles existed there, but we didn't until recently. So good luck and help James with spotting that little predator in the water. Yes, indeed, everybody. I have come here purely for the confirmation of my original suspicions reconfirmed yesterday afternoon by Scott that there is indeed a crocodile or two in this uh, water. That isn't a crocodile in picture, that is a water buck, of course, and he is walking towards the crocodile, but uh, I don't think he'll be in any danger. I don't think it's a very large crocodile. Keep watching the surface of the water, everybody. He will appear shortly. There he is. Can you see him there? He is the sort of blob in front of, well, basically sort of just over where that dove has just flown. I think that's a crocodile's head. And I know you can hardly see it from there, but I am using my very powerful binoculars. And I'm pretty sure that that's what that is. Sam, what do you think that is? Sam has got some actual binoculars. Head poking out of the water. You'd go with crocodile, would you? Mm. Fantastic. Right, everyone, before you accuse me again of spotting hippos where there are, in fact, crocodiles, I think we're going to move on from this water hole. Nothing has come down to drink here, unfortunately, and I think it's probably a function of the fact that it hasn't been a... Well, it was a very hot day earlier, but the afternoons turned out to be rather pleasant. So we're going to head down towards the western... East, yes, western. I got it right for the first time this time. We're going to head down towards the western fringes of Juma and see if there aren't any tracks around there. We might get an update also from Arethusa just to find out if they are seeing anything by way of leopard tracks. Again, I don't know where Shadow is at the moment. Uh, I'd be fascinated to know. Because the more... All right, OK, sorry, while we're doing that, Scott now has a very good view of that spiral horned kuru. Let's go and have a look. Now, this is a brief but slightly better view of a Ori, Ori. fine Ori. specimen Ori. of a big, big kuru bull. You can see, even though he's walking, you can tell he's been around the block. And... Glad we could race you across for that. No luck with the crocodile yet, I presume. But even if you can see it, it's so far away, you, there's not much to really take in there. Deb in Ohio, you would like to know why the other spiral horned antelopes are in fact called spiral horned antelopes because you can't really notice the, the spirals. Um, let's look at this bongo horn here. Look how it twists in on itself. It's not as distinctive like a corkscrew, but essentially it's like if you take a piece of spaghetti and just twist it on itself, it's going to have that twisting, spiraling effect wet spaghetti. It doesn't need, need to necessarily have big round loops in it to be spiraling, if that makes any sense. And I think if you watch how that ridge does twist, as if it has been, was once a soft piece of spaghetti that's been turned up in opposite directions from both ends, 
hence causing the spirals. The same for the, the eland here. Let's look at that. You see that? So uh, I think, Deb, that should explain things. It's just that the kudu have got very, very pronounced, almost corkscrew horns. Very good. Well, Vernie, I will apologize in advance. The chances of seeing both a sable and an eland in the sabi sand are very, very rare, but you would like to add them to your list. So what I would suggest is uh, telling as many people about Safari Alive as possible. That way, hopefully, us being able to take you to no another place in Africa where they do exist. That's going to be uh, the best and most likely possible solution for you wanting to tick those off your lists. However, there was a sable antelope seen at the Juma Waterhole camera late one night about a month ago. So it is possible, but in four and a half years of driving in various parts of this reserve, I have yet to see a sable or an eland. I don't think sable have ever, uh, sorry, eland have ever been recorded here, interestingly enough. However, sable have. Sable used to be shot for rations, Pierre, back in the day. Hard to believe they were plentiful, but times have changed, mainly due to the, I'm told, the increased amounts of artificial water points in this reserve. Sable are not water reliant, and therefore, when all the other animals that were water reliant were afforded the privilege of having water, they too brought with them competition amongst herbivores and also competition not competition, but they brought a lot of a lot of predators around. Look at this. This is going to shock you guys. It's a terrifying view of one of the most dangerous beasts. Friendly wave from Sam there on the back. No doubt learning a lot from James. Probably not driving technique, though, if that's anything to judge by. Um, goodbye. Good luck. <laughs> uh, James is a joker. How's everything coming along? Oh, um, well, better than this morning. We've seen, uh, uh, well, we've seen about four mammal species. Nice. Uh, certainly, at least four times better than this morning. Okay, good. What is your plan from here? I'm not sure. I'm yes. in a bit of a daze okay. at the moment as to what to do. I feel one of us should check uh, the west. Okay. Yeah. I'm keen to go there. Well, there we go. Problem solved. I'll go and scratch around for any further okay. sign of Karula. Perfect. And you can go west. Okay. Good deal. After Come you. Come with me, everybody. You're going to sit here now with Sam. And yeah. Scott. Yeah, screws on with Sam while we decide what to do. Cheers, everyone. See you later. Well done, everybody. That was a very smooth transition. You did an excellent job. Hardly noticed you jumping on the back here. So we'll pop across to Aratuza, see what's happening there, given that we've driven the expanse of Juma this afternoon, and we've seen lots of nice small things. Maybe Shadow has been found on Aratuza. Now before we do this, I must just erect an aerial, because if I don't, it will be impossible to hear Nicola Austin's dulcet tones, and of course, who would want to be without Nicola Austin's dulcet tones for any longer than you absolutely had to be? So as we head further to the west, this little thing has to come up. I'm not sure that the, uh, the bolt actually works anymore. I don't think it does. Yes, it does. There we go. Okay. okay. Now she will be crystal clear <laughs> and able to relay any queries you might have to my ear. So there is a little bit of a disadvantage of having the thing sticking in the front of the car, but at least it means we can hear what's going on. Here we go. Well, 
Right, we're heading into the eye of the storm there. You'll see it as we drive along here. Now, Mumsy, um, Scott was showing you a picture of an eland earlier, uh, the largest representative of the spiral horned antelope. And you want to know about that big dewlap that they have on the front of their, of their necks. And you want to know if it's fat or skin or meat. Um, you'll find it's probably largely fat and skin. And it will be some kind of, a, some antelope store fat on their shoulders, uh, around about the sort of withers, if you like. And others will store it on their necks. And I think, if I'm not mistaken with the earland, you know, it is a dry weather or dry um, habitat species. You'll find it probably does have some storage of fat and skin there. It's called a dewlap. Like a Brahmin cow has got. Now, I'm a bit reticent to go heading off to the west at a great speed, simply because there looks to be a fairly large storm coming, but I'm going to tempt it. I'm going to dare it to come and rain on my head. I don't have a rain jacket with me. David is dressed in well, very... Have you got your rain jacket? No. Oh, David's got his rain jacket. Definitely not going to rain. If it doesn't rain, it's David's fault. Um, there are some... Sorry. There's some dwarf mongoose here going absolutely crazy. Running around, you can hear them going... Pss, 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 pss. I think they're very excited by the change in the weather. chasing each other all over. <laughs> this is so cool. They normally just sit and look at us and maybe eat something, but now oh, they're actually having a play. This is brilliant. <laughs> and now they know they're being watched. So they're a bit more nervous. One looks like it's going to come across the road. No, he's gone back. Disappeared. OK, let's carry on. These are the dwarf mongoose, of course. Oh, yeah, they're coming out. So sweet. And people often ask about meerkats, very famous animals from Meerkat Manor, apparently one of the most successful wildlife shows ever made. There's one actually looking at us right now. Just in the hole here. We're only sitting about three feet from them. I'll just make that call again. Dave, you go to the right, there's one looking at us. There you go, right in that hole. You see him there. Just zoom straight into that large hole. Up. There we go. <laughs> Look at his ears. They've got the most human-like ears. He knows he's been spotted. Little pink nose. Now, this termite mound well, most was actually not inactive. It looks like it's got some fresh building on it, so they're obviously sharing parts of it with the termites. It's so sweet. Another one looking at us, middle of the screen. <laughs> Another one behind. We, now, we were chatting to Brian, of course, who did quite a lot of Neocat filming, and he reckons that these chaps, having, with his experience, would habituate like those meerkats did much faster than the meerkats. So we're thinking about doing something like that, but we'll see. It's 
so sweet. I mean, they are classic, these things, aren't they? Absolutely classic. All righty. Now, a dwarf mongoose is the size of a rat. It's about that big. That was about as big as an adult is. And so that is, what, today, about 20 centimeters long, head to tail. 20 centimeters is an inches. It's so difficult doing this all the time. Uh, nine inches. Yes, nine inches. One day, I do hope that the world will eventually realize that put their egos aside and choose one system with which to measure things. Is that a giraffe? It is a giraffe. Just in front of us. Go a bit quicker before he disappears. There's a thick bush there. So these power lines, which are not, of course, a particularly attractive piece of the wilderness, but they're highly necessary. They bring us power and they mean that we can ironically use a bit cleaner energy out here rather than using generators. So they are a necessity. We could, of course, just live in them um, without electricity, but uh, if you're trying to broadcast high definition to the rest of the world, you do need a certain amount of power to do so. That giraffe is very unconfiding. It's just disappearing off into the bushes there. David, do you have a lighter on you? I do. Yeah, I'll borrow it. Thank you. Boyd, um, I'm going to demonstrate something to you. You are worried. You say, is there any danger of a wildfire um, in the drought like this with all the lightning? Let me show you why there isn't. Now, even in the strongest possible wind, there is nothing here to burn. So if I lit a little piece of grass like this, right, it would burn a little bit like that. It would extinguish simply because there's, well, there's a little bit of moisture underneath, but also look at the gap between the different pieces of grass here. So it might burn this section and then it would have to jump a huge section here. Now the grass is very short, which means that even if this clump of grass here was to catch fire, it might flame a little bit up to there and then it would drop down again. So this is actually one of the most thickly covered pieces of grass that we have on the reserve at the moment. And even were this to get struck by lightning, I think the chances of a fire out here are so small and the chances of not being able to put it out are, well, they're negligible in this particular area. Now, these trees don't burn. And the big thing about fire out here is that it is born of the grass. The grass carries the fire. The trees do not carry the fire. It's unlike in a um, pine or eucalyptus or gum forest where the trees carry oil that is flammable. Out here, it's the grass that carries the fire. So if you don't have a grass ward, you don't have a fire. And so when there is a fire danger is after actually a good year of rain, the grass ward comes up and it would normally be sort of standing around this high. And then at the end of the dry season, so at the end of the winter, around September, October time, then it's dry like this, but twice the length. Then if you get lightning, you can get a fire that runs. So out here, no, it's really not, it's not a risk at the moment. Thank you, David. Right, Don't worry, everybody. I knew what I was doing there. Right, on we go. I'm sure there were some deep intakes of breath as I lit the felt on fire. Hello, Marianne in Arkansas. We're talking about drought, we're talking about dry, we're talking about temperature. Marianne, the 
last time we had a drought like this. In living memory, in other words, since records started being kept in 1904, that's 112 years ago, there has not been a drought like this. We have not had a summer this hot or a summer this dry before. Now, that is quite telling, I think, Marianne. And sorry, I'm just thinking quickly and just looking at the road here. And um, no tracks there. So, Marianne, it is cyclical. Absolutely, we get droughts. As soon as this El Nino effect, which is the, there's the giraffe, which is not very confiding. There she is. That's much better. She's relaxed a bit with us now. So, Marianne, El Nino is cyclical. Absolutely, I don't understand it fully, but it is cyclical. But this particular cycle is much more severe than normal. And I've heard fairly horrible stories about the possibilities of it extending into sort of heading north and melting more of the polar ice caps. And that's obviously disastrous. Well, in the scale of the short term scale of the Earth, it's disastrous. In the longer term scale, I don't suppose it makes a huge difference. But we don't know. Betting on the weather is a bit like betting on the stock market or a roulette table. We just don't understand all of the variables. It's like trying to predict anything in biology. There are so many variables that we just don't understand. Now she's fascinated by us by being slightly terrified. She's really interested. Right, now let me just change the radio here and I'm going to hope, beyond hope, that someone at Arethusa can hear me. Good afternoon, stations Arethusa. Are there any updates for the afternoon? You'll hear shortly if there are any. No. No, unfortunately, nothing. What that means, if no one is answering, it normally means that they're all on their other reserves, so they'll be on elephant planes or off down south somewhere. Anyway, we will carry on and we'll pop on there anyway and have a look to see. Lovely to hear from you. You say your silly doctors are still making you not watch safari as much as you want to and you find it unacceptable. I also find it completely unacceptable, Gracie. I'm sorry about that. You say, would I please do a rain dance uh, so that the animals can be filled with joy? Gracie, for you, of course, we will do anything. And um, I've just had uh, Sam and David here both saying, yes, they'd love to do a rain dance for you. So at the end of the drive, we will make sure that we do a rain dance for you, Gracie. On that note, let's head across to Scott, and I'll see you on there. Well, we've come across that same little zebra foal we saw earlier. We are back in the area where we are hoping to find any further sign of Karula leopardus. And these zebra have, interestingly, hardly been moving from this little patch. The whole afternoon we've seen them in the same general area. Let's creep forward and see if we can't get you some better views. I'm jealous that you guys are gonna get to see James doing a rain dance. That's gonna be most entertaining. It'll be interesting to see if he drags David and Sam along into that. So that is his plan. Very good. Interestingly, now I'm hoping now that we're nice and close, we're going to get you some views of some scars on the zebra's face. Not too sure, sure what would have caused that, but very distinctive characteristic that we can use to monitor the development of this youngster for as long as it hangs around here on Juma. Isn't it a cute little creature? got very brown tinged turds and that could simply be that it's dirty 
It does have longer fur than its mother. And it certainly does have a very brownish tinge to it. Now, why, I'm not too sure. But it could just be dirt and dustiness that's sticking onto his coat, or merely just a slightly different tinge. A little bit of a ginger tinge, I guess you could say. I'm hoping it's going to pronk around as it did a little bit earlier. It's got a very fancy running style where it appears to act like a dressage pony. Come on, go for a little trot around for us. No, it looks like it's going to try and have a little drink, but mom is not interested. It's obviously not nursing time. Uh -huh. Mr. Moustache, you would like to know if there is anything out here in the African wilderness that grows something that resembles a moustache. Hmm. Well, elephants have got a very hairy chin, but anything above the lip, which is a moustache, foof, I can't think of anything that has any kind of vaguely moustache-like growths. Goatee or beard, yes. Like I said, the elephants and a lot of the animals have got hairy chins. But what has got a hairy upper lip? Hmm. I'm racking my little brain. But can't come up with anything. Please, if anybody does have any suggestions on this matter, feel free to share your thoughts with us. But I can't think of anything. James has kindly uh, helped us out with a seal, but we don't have seals here. I guess a walrus would be another very good animal that has a very distinct moustache, probably better than that of a seal. Um, but even in the rainy season, we don't get any seals here, or when it's not a drought, rather. Nikki says a kudu, so I'm going to pull out a picture of a kudu here. I can't picture it. Nikki says there's a white something. Oh, well done, Nikki. You're right. There we go. That's it. Nicola wins. Ranger Austi. Thank you. The kudu does have a white, very thin moustache. Good. Um... Kirsty was saying a warthog. Possibly a warthog. Let's see what the warthog looks like in the book. Um, you'd think after viewing them so much, we would be able to tell. Or at least I would, but I can't. So let's have a close look. Nah, Kirst, I'm sorry. There's nothing above the upper lip on a warthog. These are sideburns, not moustache. Very fancy sideburns. <laughs> All right. Very good. There we go, Mr. Moustache. The kudu is one animal. I think that passes the moustache test. Mm, the hippo has a bit of a three-whisker moustache. And that was from somebody in Indiana. I'll get your name shortly. Possibly. Anyway, you know who you are. I didn't copy your name, sadly.
It's a difficult name to pronounce. Nikki is trying to relay it to me, but I can't seem to work out what it is. Buble or Vule or Duve. Ezra. Thank you. Desre or Ezra or Debbie. Oh, Desre. There we go. Finally. Apologies for that confusion. Come on, Karula. Beautiful, cool temperature now. <laughs> James Taylor, thank you very much for sending through some screenshots of your own moustache. That's very kind of you. <laughs> Okay, well, apparently James has found some animals that he believes have some form, some vague resemblance of a moustache, so go and see for yourselves. Well, other than the primate Scott Dyson, who has a very impressive moustache, and I imagine were he a Victorian gentleman, he'd have a tremendously impressive set of moustaches, um, I found two monkeys that could be considered to have moustaches. Now, unfortunately, I don't really have a picture, I don't think. Anyway, the red-tailed monkey, if you just zoom in here a little bit, you can see he's got a very, oh, stop it. He's got a very uh, impressive set of white moustaches. You can Google him, the, the red-tailed monkey, whiskers. And then, of course, the very severe-looking de Brazzers monkey, which has a sort of white goatee, which I think is quite amusing. Very amusing. I might have, I might actually grow one of those when I go completely grey. I think I'd look very nice with a white goatee. What do you think, Dave? Silence. Okay, that's fair enough. All right, there's the answer to that one then. Okay, on we go. And Debbie, you say that um, some birds have moustaches as well. Yes, good one, they certainly do. I can't really believe that we're discussing this, of course. This is a result of our man of mystery, Mr. Moustache. Where do we find you today, Mr. Moustache? Bermuda, the Outer Hebrides, perhaps? Uh, the Falkland Islands? Perhaps you're crossing the Drake Passage on your way to your next assignment. Watch your heads, everybody. All right, well, oh, elephant, big one, huge, huge, massive elephant coming across. He looks a little bit musty, so I'm just going to drive slowly up to him as if in order to not incur his wrath and hope that he has a bit of a dust bath for us. Driving slowly up to an animal in Jigger is almost impossible, given the noise she makes. Let's stop here for a second, Dave, see what he does. We'll just check how he reacts to us. He's watching us quite carefully. Sorry about the aerial, everyone. I'm afraid there's not I can do about that. I can't really move the car because of the angle and the thickness of the sand. Oh, he's magnificent, isn't he great? He looks like he's been at the Arethusa Dam, I think, probably having a proper swim as opposed to a dust swim. Follow him for a little while. That's not his best end, of course. But what you can see, even at this end of him, is I think that the elephants here are looking a bit skinny. I think they're looking thin. And I think that is simply a result of the drought. They look almost like those desert elephants of Namibia. And he's watching us quite carefully as he walks along. That 
it's, he's not feeding there, he's watching us, he's listening. His ears, you can very clearly see the opening to his ears there. You can probably even hear him breathing. <sighs> now, his size, everyone, he's standing at least 10 feet at the shoulder, so he's enormous. And I keep forgetting, of course, that the perspective on your screen is sometimes very difficult to get. I mean, a blue wax bill, that you will see on your screen looks almost the same size as an elephant. Now, Laura, this most certainly is not a pygmy elephant. You want to know where pygmy elephants live and you've heard that they are endangered. Laura, pygmy elephant is not, strictly speaking, the correct term. I think you're probably talking about a forest elephant. And a forest elephant occurs in the forests of Central Africa, much smaller than this, probably about two-thirds the size, in fact, even less than that. I think a big bull forest elephant only weighs about three and a half to four tons. So about, yeah, about two-thirds the size of this fellow. And they are, that certainly be considered threatened. I'm not sure that they're endangered, but certainly threatened. Elephant numbers, though, are plummeting. We don't hear about it nearly as much as we do when we talk about rhino and rhino horn. But elephant numbers, not in South Africa, but throughout Eastern Africa and other parts where the policing of national parks is not quite as good as it is here. We have tremendous issues with elephant numbers being wiped out. I'm not going to move from this particular area until he's moved up. Um, he's stopping to listen to us every so often. He's picked up a stick now to eat. But he's not, um, he's not feeding completely comfortably. He's, you know, he's, he, every time we move, he stops and watches. You'll see as he walks, he just turns his head like from side to side to have a look. He smells like he's in must. Not a heavy must, but he certainly smells like he's got a bit of must. Now, must, for those of you who are new viewers, like Sem, for example, in Holland, must is an elephant bull's time of heightened testosterone, and that means that he is ready to mate and will be looking for an estrus female. It also means that he will be slightly more irascible, so slightly more easily threatened and irritated, and that means we're not going to push it with him. I can also smell quite strongly some lion or leopard dung around here. Oof, David, isn't that disgusting? Mm -hmm. Wow, maybe Shadow is close at hand. There haven't been any lions around here recently. This is the heart of Shadow's territory. It would seem to be the heart of Shadow's latrine. Now, again, you can see that he is not feeding. He's listening to us. He's watching us. You'll just see his head turn slightly to the left every so often. And they've got tremendous peripheral vision. Apparently not so good directly from the side, interestingly enough. But he'll be watching us very carefully. So we'll keep our distance until we're in a much more open area. He's a lovely fellow. I think let's just follow him, especially as he seems to be leading us along the trail of Shadow's Dun. Check over the side here for any signs of tracks. Don't see any at the moment. Now, Jackie's class, you're in Illinois. We'll just quickly look at the elephant still. He's just on the road there and still listening to us. Jackie's class, you're in Illinois. I think you're a fifth grade class, if I'm not mistaken. And you want to know where is Karula, what has happened to her cubs. So for those of you who don't know, the Queen of Juma, we definitely found in a den with a cub, at least one cub, about three weeks ago. Now, we then zoned the area, we just to leave her alone, give her space. 
We saw her outside of that area a few times and we decided that we would go in and check after two weeks or so, which we then did. And she has then moved from that den. Now, we don't know if she still has cubs or not. We have not found another den, largely because we're not actually looking for it. And the decision is to let her be on her own for now. If we see her on the road, if we track her, like we were tracking her this morning, away from anywhere where we think she could have a den, then we will track her. But otherwise, we've been letting her be. The general consensus amongst the guides of the area is that the cubs are more than likely not made it. So that's more than likely that they haven't made it. So I don't want to disappoint you. I'm, there's a small piece of me that thinks she's still got them stashed somewhere, especially as we're seldom seeing her tracks on the road, which means that she's not moving around as much as she might normally be. So that's the update there. He definitely smells a bit in musk. It's not a very strong smell. And the reason they smell is that they drip urine. They drip a kind of, it's not pure urine, but it's a kind of um, greenish substance. And it covers the inside of the legs, which we can't really see here, I think because he's been in the water. But you can definitely smell it. just chewing and he's watching us you know those eyes are watching us he's chewing a nice piece of stick and I can hear to the left of that elephant there's some others moving in the bush there I think probably a herd and he may well be tracking that herd so we are now sitting at about 40 to 50 meters from him which is about 150 feet and I think that's a comfortable distance for us to be from an elephant like this at the moment. There's no need to push him any further. Ah, now Tom, you say there is a pygmy elephant in Sumatra and Borneo. And thank you for that. So it must be, it must be a, a sort of smaller version of the Asian elephant, which of course is a different species from this altogether. The forest elephant and the savanna elephant are in fact the same genus. There is some people that consider them the same species. So the pygmy elephant is obviously related more closely probably to the, just here the elephant through there, to the Asian elephant. And thank you very much for that, Tom. That's fascinating information. Uh, this is why for me, this is the best possible kind of a naturalist's job because we get to learn all the time from our viewers. And thank you very much, Tom. The pygmy elephant of Borneo and Nicola Sumatra is the word you were going for then. I think that's what we're going for, Tom. Nicola thought it was something else, not quite Sumatra. Anyway, there goes the elephant. He will be listening very carefully for the rest of that herd, hoping that there's an estrus female who will be receptive to his advances. And of course, if there isn't, there's nothing he can do about it. He cannot mate with a female that doesn't want to mate with him. Because of the awkward um, sort of nature of elephants, they, ha they can't jump, so he's, she has to stand still for him. She has to almost reverse into him in order for them to mate. So she has to be very receptive. Uh, rock and rolly, um, it's not white. You're looking there on the top of the back and you say, what's the white stuff? It's not white, rock and rolly, it's just the light catching it. It's mud, it's actually black mud. It does look white, I can see exactly what you mean. It's black mud, a very shiny black mud, obviously very clay rich, and it's just reflecting a lot of light. Now that six ton elephant bull has all but disappeared. Isn't that amazing? Look. He's hardly 80 kilometers from us, 80 meters from us. Now, Lynn, you want to see an elephant track. Um, let's mm, be better down in the drainage line there. Let's just see if he doesn't walk onto some softer sand, and then definitely we'll show you. It'll be about that big. So, just over a foot, a foot and a half long. Yeah, you, I can see them, but you won't pick them up on the camera in this light on this road. Let's see if he doesn't walk through some softer stuff. 
Kings Road is just getting stonier and stonier and stonier. But Lynn and I will definitely try. He's still up ahead of us there. So he's not going towards the herd that I can hear through here. Hello, Victor Brown. You say you've been watching for a couple of months now. Elephants have quickly become one of your favorites. I think that goes for anybody who's watched elephants for any length of time. They are the most spectacular animals. Something tremendously calming about watching them, well, most of the time, and something tremendously impressive about them. I'm gonna stop here again. He's definitely stopping every so often just to listen, so I'm gonna drop my voice. Blowing dust on himself, just getting the parasites off. You can think how quietly he's moving through the bush there. He's almost inaudible compared with the noise of this vehicle. Let's see if you can hear his footfalls. All right, I think I'm going to follow this elephant for a little bit longer. We'll head up the road. Uh, while we're doing that, though, Scott has a scavenging carnival to show you. Well, there's something that's not quite right about this hyena's behavior. I'm not too sure what is wrong with it. It is in the same area that we did see hyena this morning when some of you were lucky enough to get Brian doing a little bit of narrating. And, oh no, look closely, look at how much drool's coming from its mouth. And maybe it's merely the heat that's causing it to drool like this. The right eye, there's also a problem, maybe it's been bitten by a snake, I don't know. But it is not in a good, not in a good state of affairs at the moment. That's for certain. I'm keen to just keep an eye on it. Obviously, to try and work out what is wrong with it, and also because this is the area where we did have tracks of Karula heading towards. Now, when we went off on foot, we did see a hyena run off from its sleeping place. Let's see if it doesn't rub its face now in the, in the ground. That might be a, a clue that it was, in fact, bitten by a snake, like I suggested. Again, just the theory, nothing confirmed. It was just that swollen eye coupled with that drooling mouth makes me wonder, what is going on? Just also seems a little bit uncomfortable. It's not moving as freely as often hyenas will move, and it's just kind of a little bit uncomfortable, it seems. So, who knows? Let us know what your thoughts may be as to what may have happened to this hyena. I've never seen a hyena act like this, so I can't give a very educated uh, guess as to what's going on, but maybe it's just the heat. Maybe it's a snake bite. Who knows? We were, interestingly enough, going to make our way to the hyena den after checking this area one last time for any further sign of Karula, but it looks like we may not get a chance to get there if we stay with this one. Rock and Roller, you mentioned that you hope it's not one of the mothers from the den. I don't think it is. Um, and that's why I think it almost is almost a nomadic male, possibly, there were two of them that headed into this area this morning. One of which I saw run off from a sleeping place when searching for Karula, a female leopard whose tracks were moving here. So I don't think it's any of the mothers from the den. It would also be very far away from the den for a mother to spend her day. 
unless there is a kill very close by, which I don't think is the case. Hopefully I'm, I'm wrong. But yeah, I don't think it is one of the mothers, so we can take a deep breath there and a sigh of relief. Ah, Snoop and Charlie, I was waiting for somebody to put forward the suggestion that possibly it is rabid. That would be terrible. And yeah, uh, again, definitely possible. Um, but that would be the last thing we would want. A snake bite would be better, not possibly for this individual, but for the greater good of all the animals within the Sabi Sands rabies outbreaks. Uh, not what we want in an area like this. Well, I don't think uh, unless we were to sedate this animal and get a vet in to tell us what he thinks is the problem, I don't think we are going to get to the bottom of it, but some interesting behavior to see nonetheless. We are going to continue on and leave it there. And if we do swing past later, we'll obviously be able to keep an eye on it. As we could see, though, it seemed quite relaxed, lying down there, not too uncomfortable. And possibly it was just the heat that caused it to be drooling like it was. Hello, Chase in Jackie's class in Illinois. You'd like to know what poisonous snakes could have bitten the hyena. Firstly, Chase, I just want to correct you. It's a mistake that a lot of people make, including myself, before I was once corrected. Poison is something that you swallow. Um, so if you eat it, it becomes harmful to you. Whereas venom is something that is injected to you that then harms you. If you drink snake's venom, it will not be poisonous. It is only if it is injected into your bloodstream that you are harmed. So that's something important to remember. So the correct term would be, are there any venomous snakes or what are the venomous snakes, not the poisonous snakes? Um, a whole long list, Chase, Black Mamba, uh, we saw one yesterday afternoon, a brief glimpse of one, which was great. That's got a uh, highly uh, toxic uh, venom, as well as the puff adder would be another one. That would be more likely to cause swelling. Um, there's a whole host of different snakes. The boom slang causes bleeding. And basically, out of all the snakes you, you get around the world, there's three different types of venom, but it's always generally a mixture. Of, of all three. Um, some snakes may have more cytotoxic venom, which attacks your, f your flesh and will cause you to maybe lose a finger if a snake bites you on the end of the finger. So it's a flesh-destroying uh, toxin or venom. The others are a nervous system. They're neurotoxic. They stop your heart from working, your lungs from working, your brain from working. They make breathing difficult. But if you can survive it, you won't necessarily lose a finger. So that's neurotoxic venom. And then you get hemotoxic venom, which attacks the blood, which will cause you to bleed profusely. And uh, your blood won't be able to coagulate. So you won't, you'll basically just have very, very thin blood. And any uh, orifice of your body will become an exit point for that blood. So those are the three different types of venom that you get with snakes around the world. Again, judging from that hyena's symptoms, a bit of swelling on the face, um, po possibly a, a snake with cytotoxic venom, so attacking uh, the, the cells. Again, just a hypothesis, but many different types of snakes are venomous out here. Craig Johnson, you would like to know what are the chances of seeing a puff adder? In this area of uh, South Africa, not great. It's not a highly uh, populated area with puff adders. Um, I have seen a handful in the Sabi Sands in my entire four and a half years of driving around here, but there are certainly other areas of Africa where they are more common.
We had an incredible sighting, though, probably one of the best snating, snake sightings I've ever had with you guys with a puff adder where we actually followed it slithering through the grass. I think it was looking for a mate. It was in winter, and that's when they do their mating. So surprised that it wasn't in the summer months when you expect to see snakes more when it's warm. So, Craig, yeah, um, there is a chance, but not a, not a great one in this area of South Africa. Good. James is still with the elephant bull, so we s will send you back to him while we make our way to the hyena den. He's just gone around the corner, and Lynn, you wanted to get some idea of his tracks. There they are. I'm not going to get out of the car and show them to you because he's just around the bushes there. But there you can see his tracks. But the light is very flat, of course, so it's quite difficult to see them. But there you can see those vast tracks. And they're about one and a half feet tall, long, the front ones, the back ones slightly shorter, but they're about a foot by a foot, I guess. And he's gone, unsurprisingly, straight up the road. We're just going to keep going slowly behind him. We have kept moving. The last time we stopped, he was sort of looking behind him a bit more and flapping his ears a little, which, uh, well, it's not a hot day. I think he, and he was flapping his back leg. He's just indicating that he, we must keep our distance, otherwise he'll get irritated. Of course, you don't want six tons of irritated elephant bearing down on you. Now, Anna McDougall, Scott has been teaching you about venomous versus poisonous, and you want to know if a venomous snake is able to kill an elephant. I do not see this fellow anymore, so I'm going to keep my eyes out for him. He might be sneaked, sneaked off behind a bush here. Anna McDougall, there is no snake that I know of that would have sufficient venom to kill an elephant. Many of the animals out here as well, of course, despite even the smaller ones, are not, in fact, they're kind of immune to the venom of snakes. And one of great example of that is a, is a honey badger. There's that wonderful footage of a honey badger. He was here. He's still going up the road. Wonderful example of a honey badger being bitten by a snouted cobra, I think it was. And the honey badger goes to sleep for four hours and then gets up and it carries on. So some animals are just immune. Their physiologies will digest still on the road. His, their physiologies will just digest um, digest the, the, the venom. There he is. You may laugh, but it's not, it's quite, it's quite difficult to, it's, it's not easy, it's not difficult to lose an elephant this big. I tell you that because Nicola's laughing at me. She thinks it's very funny that I managed to lose this elephant. Um, Larry, you want to know if we get Cape Cobras up here? Mercifully, Larry, we do not get Cape Cobras here. Cape Cobras, ostensibly, if I'm not mistaken, in the south, in the Cape, it's starting to rain. I'm just going to put my, my little waterproof bucky on top here. Um, Larry, Cape Cobra, of course, a nasty neurotoxic venom, much like a black mumbers, actually, and very similar effect a snake you want to be bitten by. Well, you don't really want to be bitten by any snake, to be honest. But Larry, we get two or three uh, different cobra species around here. The snouted would be the most obvious. We get a Mozambique and spitting cobra as well. But every time I get to within this distance of him, he stops moving and turns his head and looks. I'm not going to go any closer than this. <laughs> this is fantastic. This is so awesome. Now, Judy, you're in Tuholu School in Washington. Apparently, the kids are watching in the cafeteria. 
Hello kids in Washington in Tiholo or Tuholo school. I hope you're enjoying this elephant all the way from the wilds of Africa. It's absolutely awesome to have you watching us while we're over here. And please feel free to talk to us. I don't know if you're allowed cell phones at school. Tweet us, hashtag Safari Live or questions at wildearth.tv. Welcome, enjoy your lunch. Stay healthy, of course. And rock and rolly, you say, despite the fact that it's raining, we're still going to need a rain dance. Why? It's raining, right? The guys in the back of the car think we don't need a rain dance at all. It's raining now. We could do with more rain. We could do with more rain. That's Sam saying he does want to do a rain dance. OK. All right, Sam. It's no problem. There goes the elephant walking off the road. He's just taking a shortcut. We've come to the end of our traversing area, of course. We're now moving on to, well, we're not going to move on to, but we are coming to the boundary of Simbambili, where I did, by mistake, make a foray the other day. Now, Neo Lack, a very valid question. You want to know what happens if the elephant attacks? Well, ideally we run away at a great speed, Neolac. So we'll just have a look here. There we go. There's a nice shot of him. So Neolac, if he was to attack, now there are two ways of looking at this. If he was to demonstrate his discomfort with us, if he was to shake his head, He's demonstrating he's not that comfortable with us at the moment. He's watching me quite carefully. He's also decided to take the road we have to take. So, Neolak, if he was to shake his head, face us, and kind of take a few steps towards us, that would be a sign that he was uncomfortable and he wanted us to go away, in which case, unless we were silly, we would just go away. If he was to push through a charge, if we could drive away, then we would. If, however, we were in a position where we couldn't drive forward. Uh, we would have to try and stand our ground, clap, make a noise, and see if we couldn't make him stop. And so that's what we'd have to do. Now, he's going along the road where we need to go. I'll show you where we are. So, <laughs> there is, um, there is Arethusa. That is Simbambili, where I've been by mistake before. I hope no one from Simbambili is watching. And he has gone along that road there, that cut line, which is the road we have to travel to get back to Juma. OK. Right, let's go back across to Scott. He's got a little scrub hair. That's very exciting. We'll see you shortly. Well, this is a site that I have never been able to share with you, a scrub hair in the daylight, feeding. It even used its little paws earlier to scratch around and try and reveal whatever tiny little short shoots of grass remain. Oh! Let's see if we can't get you a few more views. And this is, again, thanks to the drought. This hair would not ordinarily be out at this stage of the evening, but it's desperate, it's hungry, there's not much food around. Look at its ears, look at those veins in its ears, and they are huge. This is so cool. Very, very white tail with that. Well, white and black, I guess. And you would have noticed I called it a hare, not a rabbit. There's some distinct differences between hares and rabbits. Rabbits live underground, whereas hares live above the ground. Rabbits have also got much smaller ears than hares. And rabbits will have 
more of a hopping motion, whereas hares will have more of a running motion. I'm told that one I battle to understand exactly, but there is a difference in their locomotion. Well, this is wonderful, but I fear that in this fading light, it'll mean that we will not get to... Ooh, what's that there, Vian? Something around there. Oh, no, there's some Nyala off in the distance. I thought there was a pack of hyena descending upon us, but it's... Ooh, that Nyala bull's doing some phylo erection. It's a slow motion dance. He's erected his mane all the way to his tail, trying to impress the ladies. Oh, there's a few tiny little droplets of rain falling. But nothing considerable. Let's continue on to the hyena den. We're not far away, but I fear that in this very low light, we're not going to get too many good visuals. But let's go and see. Let's go and see what happens. just shot across the road. I think that was, yeah, that was the same one that was doing the phylo erection. So a reminder for all of you, I'm not sure if James has reminded you, I'm guessing he has because Sam is on his vehicle, but there will be a new face behind the wheel of one of these vehicles tomorrow, and his name is Sam. He is younger than all of the presenters and not as experienced as all of us, but it's important that Wild Earth look for some new upcoming guys as opposed to old stale ones. So, he has done a training course, though, in the Sabi Sands for seven months. He'll tell you more about it, though, but he is not as experienced as us, which is great. So it'll mean that a lot of the older viewers, this is, in fact, only if he gets the job, I guess, after his interviews, but I guess it means the older viewers will get to watch a, a, a younger guide grow, and the newer viewers will grow with, with a younger guide. So there's huge benefits in having a young guide and like all of the lodges in South Africa, not all of them just employ older experienced guides. All of them will at some point employ some young guides to bring some energy and youthful joy to the team. So I guess that's the angle that will be being worked with Sam. And from what little I know of him, he seems like a great guy and he's really excited to take you guys on an adventure with him. And I think he'll not only be doing a drive tomorrow morning, but also on Saturday morning. So two drives that'll worth, be worth tuning in for if you guys are looking for a change of scenery. Failing that, you'll have to wait until Brent and Jamie return from their leave, I think on the 4th of March. Um, then you'll get to be taken around by them. But until such point, it'll be James and myself. We may be able to get you just a few glimpses of the hyena. So I'm gonna rush us down this bumpy road. Yes, Nicola, our roadblock is still in the road. You can't even really notice it, but it's done its job. Just on the left over here, we put these branches here to prevent people driving along what was a kind of track there. And then further beyond that, there's another big log over there because people were taking kind of two routes, which wasn't necessary, so to prevent unnecessary compaction of the ground, which prevents future growth, unless it's re-plowed. We decided to put those logs there. to get 
to see the actual termite mound that is the den just yet because we've got some hyena right here and it looks to be pretty in November. Thank you, Nikki, for aiding me with that. I'm battling to tell who's who at the moment, not spending enough time to work that out. And it looks like November's enjoying a little evening snack before I guess pretty heads off and then I'm just going to try and roll forward ever so slightly because there are some more of them to the left. Oh, that little cub wasn't too interested in what was going on there. And that's a youngster. It looks like it is coming back, though. Here it comes. That's one of the newest additions. I think these are the January babies and are still very black in coloration. Hello. Cute, and there's a few more hyena. I'm not sure, Fiam, if you've got an angle. You might not scattered about the various burrows. Yeah, there we go. There's a few more wiggling about over there. So the reason why we don't illuminate the den is so that we don't interfere in any way with the sensitivity of, you know, mothers trying their best to raise young cubs, which are, of course, vulnerable compared to when they are larger. And by shining spotlights, we're just going to be attracting... Oh, that cub didn't like whatever was coming to say hello to its mother. It looks like there could be another hyena coming in. But basically, oh, please can we vocalize? It looks like these two adults are thinking about it. Basically, by illuminating the den, we're just going to be creating unnecessary attention to it and also blinding the animals that are in the spotlights, allowing anything that is going to be creeping in from the shadows to have a very clear advantage over them. So it's just good practice not to shine lights on young animals, therefore den sites, and that is what we are sticking to here. Hello to Chris, who's in America, but very close to the Canadian border. And you would like to know what... Ooh, listen carefully. We may get a vocalization. Come on. Call for us. Chris is wanting to know what is one of the sounds that is typical to hear when out in Africa on safari at night. And hyena are probably one of the most vocal of the animals in general in this area. Lion audio is another audio that you can expect to hear. VM, there looks like so there's some more coming in here. Um, so yes, um, hyena audio, lion audio, the rasping call of a leopard, a lot of owls will call at night. We've just spotted another one somewhere over here. Oh, there we go. And I think that's November playing around over there. So a lot of the owls, um, Chris, it depends on the time of the year, though, and your area of Africa that you may be in. But a whole host of different calls can be heard at night. Again, depending on the time of the year and also just depending on your luck. Some nights here we hear lions roaring, some nights we don't. The smells of Africa, a lot of dung-like smells, I guess, uh, are typical. Um, no different to that of, I guess, cow dung or horse dung would be a typical kind of smell that a lot of you may be able to relate to. There's some Franklin calling off in the background that you can hear now. Um, what other smells are distinctive of Africa? Now there's... I don't know, it's a very distinctive smell, and a lot of people say that there's no other smell quite like the fresh 
but earthy air of Africa. Um, but again, a lot will depend on your time of year when you are here, whether you're in winter or summer. Um, but a whole host of wonderful smells and sounds can be heard. If you are interested to hear the sounds of Africa, I guess when the Juma Wotsall camera is up and running, you can just have that playing in the background almost softly while you sleep. And that way you will be able to hear, I guess the time zones aren't going to be, be right for that, but you could record the sounds of Africa at night and then play them very softly while you're sleeping and then you can just gently wake up almost as if you are here. Um, so that would be a good way of trying to simulate the sounds of African nights and how they do fluctuate. Um, but the smells are going to be a little bit more for us to, or at least for me, to describe to you. Hello, Dina in Michigan. And you were wondering if there was somebody telling us what to say and where to go. Um, to a degree, it's a, it's a team effort because there is Nikki sitting in the final control room. He's being assisted by, I think, Louise this afternoon. He's going through all the questions that get through and they basically get, f uh, it's uh, Kirsty McLennan-Smith in D2 and basically direct two filters through questions that they think are applicable that get fed through to director one who then further filters and chooses which questions get th sent through to me. Obviously they don't tell me what to say when answering the question, that's up to me. But we jointly will decide whether to stay in some areas or go. Obviously uh, Nikki has got a much better idea of how the safari is unfolding because she is seeing what you guys are seeing. Um, not being able to listen to as much as you are because they're coordinating things between the other vehicle. And you can imagine when there are five inputs during our TV broadcasts, what chaos and pandemonium reigns in the final control room because then the director has to keep all the five different feeds, the two vehicles, the bushwalk, the bush tent, the safari tents, plus the drone, all in the loop, count them into going live. It gets hugely chaotic in there and I do not want to be or do not uh, uh, yeah I do not want to be anywhere near that room on those days because it's incredibly tough business but uh, on our regular internet drives like this with two vehicles it's, it's, it's a bit more of a calm affair unless of course there's action unfolding on both vehicles then it gets a little bit more chaotic and confusing as to what to do well, I think it's too dark for us to spend much more time here now, so we're going to head back. I want to see what we can find with the use of a spotlight. And while we get all that equipment out and ready, we are going to send you across to James, who I'm guessing is already in night drive mode. Now we are on night drive mode, everybody. We're looking for night things. We only have a few minutes left, but what we're looking for, and of course, for a long time we haven't been using the spotlights because it was not quite dark by seven o'clock when we finished. So we're looking for creatures of the night. These would include civets, of which I've seen one here, but their tracks are all over the place during the morning. We might find a white-tailed mongoose on quarantine clearings. We might find a genet, which is a smaller kind of mongoose-like animal. Looks like a cat, but isn't. Uh, we might find a leopard, that would be nice. Uh, we might find an African wild cat, we could find a chameleon. We could find a bush baby. We could just find the vast expanse of the Kruger National Park, free of any kind of sort of obvious vertebrate life during the course of the night. The one positive thing that comes from a drought, if you're a human being shining a light in the night, is the lack of insects careening into your face creating, uh, well, acid burns in the eye sometimes, a concussion from dung beetles coming at 60 kilometers an hour from the other direction. Uh, and what we'll do, and we'll stop just down here and have a smell and a listen, because Chris, I know that you were asking Scott earlier about what the different smells sounds of the night are. It changes almost on a daily basis, certainly on a seasonally basis. 
So let's just stop now. We'll just stop in the clearing over here and we'll have a listen. What we are smelling now, of course, as the water starts to drop gently out of the sky, is petrichor. And petrichor is a word I say at least four times a day, because otherwise I forget it. And it is the smell that the earth gives you when it is touched by new rain. All right, let's stop here. Stop bumping around in this car. I can't see what's going on because I'm trying to shine the spotlight. Okay. Now, I can definitely smell a little bit of petrichor, that lovely earthy smell that comes when new rain touches the dry earth. You can probably hear the pitter-patter of drizzle, which is a lovely sound out here. You can hear the ubiquitous woodland kingfisher yelling its head off all the time. The odd Franklin calling. you want to see a bush baby. Carla, I'm not sure we can show you, or we could try and find a bush baby. We certainly have found a few of late, but not much in the way of, I haven't seen a large number of them recently. Of course, there are the fiery necked nightjars. I just saw one fly past, well, it was a nightjar, whether it was fiery necked or not, I don't know. But on a cloudy night like this, with a storm kind of brewing, you'll find that the night is a lot more silent than it would be otherwise. We started hearing owls, scops owls, at the beginning of the season, but they seemed there. There's one I heard a scops, scops owl going there. Cool. You hear it. That's very cool. Now, Mr. Moustache, um, wondering about where big animals and how big animals like giraffe and elephant can sleep at night. Um, giraffe can either sleep standing up or they sleep lying down. But when they lie down, they just fold their legs underneath them and they keep their heads dead straight up because if they don't do that, the pressure build up on the brain is too much and their brains would explode while they were asleep, which of course nobody really wants to sleep, wake up with their exploded brain. So that's the giraffe, but they can sleep standing up. Now, lots of elephants will sleep standing up, but the very little ones will lie down. And we had an incredible experience the other day. We were driving along behind a herd of elephants. It was just getting dark. And the herd decided that they'd had enough of the day. They stopped, and all the little ones, three or four of them, lay down and went to sleep on the ground while the adults just stood around. So elephants can, stand, can sleep standing up, otherwise they'll lie against a termite mound, they often lean against a termite mound. But a big elephant won't spend too much time on its side because those organs are so massive. And I mean, even with human beings, they tell you, don't lie you know, on, on your side for too long. It's why we move a lot in bed. Um, because we're designed to be upright and an elephant's designed to be upright as well, those huge organs will start to crush each other if they stay on their sides for too long. It's quite interesting. OK, let's keep driving along a little bit here. See if we can find any bush babies. For primates. Nicola says that made her insides feel funny, which means she probably won't sleep tonight. She'll be rolling from side to side, worried that her organs are going to be crushed. Oh, I suppose I should turn some lights on. Makes sense, given that it's dark. I'm so pleased we heard that scops out. I haven't heard him for a long time. The beginning of the season when the rain, we had that first little bit of rain, they were calling a lot. I think Jamie actually found one, or Jamie or Scott found one. It may have been Brent, I don't know who found one, I just know I didn't find one. Hello Diane in Texas, um, you've made my evening for two reasons. The first is that you've sent through a question 
it has um, made Nicola have to say the word nonchalant, which is uh, wonderful. Thank you for that. And you want to know, you say our birds are very beautiful, and you want to know, do we ever get nonchalant about seeing our magnificent birds? Um, I, I think we probably do, you know, I think it's inevitable, but the joy, half the joy of discovering or rediscovering the beautiful creatures around here with you is that you can't take them for granted because our viewers, you, see them for the first time often and sometimes for the 10th or 11th or 12th time, 20th time, and you're just as impressed. And that reinvigorates an interest in the things out here. And so while I may see a grey go-away bird and think, ah, it's a grey go-away bird, I had them in the garden growing up, we see them on screen and people ask questions about them and their amazing structure, incredible beak, you know, and the, the plume on the back of their heads, and suddenly, you know, they're in a new world of discovery. So, Diane, I suppose we tend towards it as any human would, but driving around here with all of you certainly tends us away from taking anything for granted. Thank you. Don't see any creatures of the night, which is a pity. It's not getting too windy. Nicholas says if you can hear the wind in my mic. I think that's because my mic's coming out of my shirt. There we go, Nicola. I hope that's better. Look in all the marula trees to see if there isn't a bush baby. So see, now the bush babies, of course, would normally be eating insects at this time of the year. But because there are no insects, or very few, they will have to eat the tree gum and tree bark, or at least acacia gum, that they would normally in the winter. So let's straight down here. We're going to have a quick look at the dam, the Juma Dam pan, see what's going on there. See if Karula hasn't popped out at some stage during the afternoon. And while we're doing that, we'll head back to Scott and we will prepare our rain dance in the meantime. Well, I'm sure a lot of you are eagerly awaiting the rain dance and that's going to be a great way to finish off the sunset safari not too much to report other than the fact that i think there's a couple of birmingham's possibly all of them in the general area of where brent found the Inkahuma pride to the east of us so that's Good prospects. Hopefully they'll be able to finish off that buffalo cow, the five in Kumalinas, plus maybe five of the Birmingham's, and that way they'll maybe come and visit us sometime early tomorrow morning if we're lucky. It'll be great to see all of them again. Jimelin, good evening, and great to have you with us. You would like to know how you communicate with guests who ca cannot speak uh, English or you cannot speak their language from foreign countries. Uh, books, your pictures, you use your mammal book to point at an animal that you can point to, uh, to, to indicate that's what you're looking for, you know, points in the book, then they understand. Uh, or you just pff, don't speak to them, really. It's, uh, it's, it's not easy. Um, it's happened to me on a few occasions. But you just, you know, you make, you make do with it. It all depends, uh, it, it all depends on the, the individual guests, I guess, um, and the personality that you strike up with one another, even despite the fact that you cannot speak one another's language. Sometimes um, 
you know, even if you do speak somebody's language, you may be on different wavelengths to them, and therefore, even though speaking, you may speak the same language, it doesn't mean that you necessarily get along too well, if that makes any sense. Um, but it hasn't happened too often to me, I guess. A lot will depend on which camp you work at. Um, the camps I've worked at, guests that do come that cannot speak tend to bring translators. Or uh, we actually, at the one camp where I worked, we had a French and Spanish speaking guide that was fully employed there to cover those bases. So you deal with the French and the Spanish speakers. Um, but yeah, it, 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 it can be a little bit tricky, but it can also be fun to a degree. You and your tracker can just talk freely to one another um, and they just chat amongst themselves. Um, a few little raindrops are falling down on us. So that's wonderful, but nothing considerable. We don't have to put the rain cover on. There's just a few, although it's increasing now, so that's good. But um, sad to say, I don't think it's going to be anything substantial, unless I am wrong, which would be great. So I hope I am wrong. The Juma vegetation needs a desperate little VM get ready here. There's a bush baby, but it looks like it's already evacuated the area. Just so we may get a glimpse of it as we creep around this corner. It's a small nocturnal primate that is incredibly cute. Hmm. Where did you skedaddle to, little bush baby? They have the incredible ability to be able to leap huge distances in the dark and can therefore disappear out of view very quickly. Carla, you were asking for a bush baby. Apologies, we got close there, but it hopped away. Maybe there'll be another one. Come on, bush babies. It's been a while since I've got a good view of one with you guys. Um, that is something else, Vim. <laughs> We have spotted something in a tree up ahead of us, but it's not what we are looking for. Well, guys, it's been a great fun, as always, having you on safari and hopefully tomorrow morning will bring us some action-packed adventures i'm not sure whether james or myself is going to be driving we haven't uh, discussed that yet but it'll be one of us together with sam who you may get to see doing his rain dance shortly but a big thanks for all of your contributions questions and simply joining us on the Sunset Safari. Always great fun. Thank you to Nikki and Kirsty in the final control room. And thank you as well to Viam for documenting the adventures along the way. Come on, one last bush baby for Carla. Or a chameleon, anything. No, I don't think we're going to get lucky this evening, but that does not matter because you guys are in for an absolute treat, and that is that you're going to see James, possibly David, and possibly Sam, three fine souls doing a ridiculous dance. It sounds like they might be trying to choreograph some moves because I was told that I'd be able to link to them about two minutes ago, but they're still obviously practicing a few things. Here's the girls in final control room. We might be able to snipe you a little gap of them here. Let's see, no, I think they've closed the curtains. But they're somewhere in that little window through that. Oh, there's Nikki, she's poked her head out. Hello. Cool. Okay, so she's directing the show. That's Nicola Austin. And I think they're just practicing one or two final maneuvers. And no, nope, they're ready. So you guys are in for a treat. Have fun and see you all in the morning. Enjoy the rain dance. 
Okay, everybody, there in front of us is the Sam man from Cape Town and David, and I am now going to exit the vehicle. Um, we are going to play a song uh, produced by Brian and me during the course of one of our drives, and uh, we hope that this will bring on the rain. Uh, let's just do a quick sound check here. Thank you so much. That will do. <laughs> Enough complete ridiculousness. Right. Exhausting. Well done, fellows. Well done, stout fellows. Well done. Good job. Mm. Okay. <sighs> okay. Thank you, everybody, for a wonderful drive. I will be going back home now uh, to recover from what was exhausting spiritually, mentally, and emotionally. Tomorrow morning, you will be driving with the, the hand dancer, Sam. <laughs> Thank you to Dave on camera today. Thanks to Scott and VM on the other vehicle. And of course, Nikki and Kirsty in the final control. We'll see you tomorrow at 0500, 0530. Stay safe and happy wherever you are in the world. Bye-bye.